Oops, what is that? Is that yours? Looks like it is. Let me sort it out. Oh, yeah. Hey, everybody. That's good. That's good. Bald man good. Bald man on time. Other bald man 10 minutes late. Sorry, guys. Uh, punctuality is not my game today, but uh, here we are. And I've got with me today the nutrition science watchdog, Bart K. Mr. Bart K., thanks for coming on the show, man. Great to talk to you. Hey, no problem at all. Um, hi, boys and girls. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, even though it is 5 a.m. Um, or just after. Um, you know, we will take one for the team, whatever it takes to get the word out there to you. Now, me and Bart K. just got done discussing which steroids we use to make ourselves so gloriously bald. And um, um, yeah, actually, I was... I thought Bart K may have plagiarized my shiny head, but it turns out he did not. He he assured me that he did not plagiarize my head, and um, we're just we're just both bald men bad. So today we're going to be having a fun conversation. We're going to be talking a little bit about uh, well whatever we want to talk about. Um, I titled this talk "How to Interpret and Read Nutrition Studies in Vegan Debate Tactics." So I think we might as well go ahead and start out and kind of talk a little bit about how to read studies what the heck is going on in these vegan debates maybe we can talk a little bit about the vegan debate tactics that are so common online and hopefully we can help out the audience with some of these debates that they get involved with so i know a lot of people here we see them in the comments all over the internet engaging with the veganjelicals and um there are there do seem to be some common tactics that they use and i guess maybe a place to start out mr bart k is uh epidemiology and studies in general. So I guess um, let's start out talking mm. about epidemiological studies. What is epidemiology and oh, yes. how should we be interpreting this epidemiological data? This high-level studies, boys and girls. High the hierarchy level. of evidence. Yes. That's it. So that's the first thing they will do is they will hinge their argument around epidemiology and they will quote this supposed hierarchy of evidence. What folks need to understand is that the hierarchy of evidence is a consensus idea which was put together by a bunch of people who don't actually have any evidence for their position whatsoever. So what they're doing is saying, we're going to claim we have authority in high level, and we're going to use the words high level, we're going to use the words hierarchy. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, meta-analyses, epidemiology is at the top of this pyramid, if you like, of the hierarchy of evidence. Now, the first thing to say is that it's absolute fetid dingo's kidneys. It's nonsense. Um, the hierarchy of evidence, as it was originally proposed by some actual scientists, talks about meta-analyses being high on the hierarchy. Now, that's true if you're talking about a meta-analysis of well-controlled, double-blind, crossover clinical trials, okay? Um, it does not mean studies of a bunch of correlations which are then presented as evidence for a position. So basically, I mean, that's that's the first sort of point of contention with these vegetards um, is that they're going to come at you with we have this hierarchy of evidence, though, and we have high-level studies, though. I mean, to which the answer is no, you don't. So epidemiology, exactly how does an epidemiological study get done? Like, What is the process of putting together a study based on epidemiology? And, um, yeah, I guess that's, a, that's another good place to start. Okay, well, let, let's just run a sort of an, an analogy, if you like. Let's let's do one. Basically, what we want to do when we're doing epidemiology is we want to get an idea of trends in a target population, whoever that target population may be. Let's say that our target population, Tristan, is children aged between 5 and 10 years old in any westernized country you like, it doesn't matter. And these children all attend a primary school. 
And what we want to do is we want to get an idea of what the relationship is between their mathematical ability and the length of their right foot from the back of the heel to the end of the big toe. Okay? So children between ages 5 and 10, that's our one of our variables that we're looking at. And our other variable is their, the length of their foot. And what we're going to do is we're going to collect up all this data from all these children, and we're going to collect hundreds and thousands of them because that way we've got really good statistical power, and it's absolutely certain that what we found is you know not due to chance. Uh, do you want to preempt what we're going to find, or? Yeah. What do you What do you think we would find there? Well, what we're going to find is if we give all those children a mathematical test, the ones who are uh, ten years old are going to do better than the ones that are five years old. The ones who are nine years old are going to do slightly less well, eight years slightly less well, etc. And at the same time, the size of their feet is going to get bigger as they get at the age between five and ten mm -hmm. years old, yeah? Mm -hmm. So we're going to find highly correlated data, boys and girls, highly mm -hmm. correlated. We've got hundreds of thousands of observations here that say, as your feet get bigger, so does your mathematical ability increase. Now, out of that, here's what we're going to do. We are going to stop training and paying math mathematics teachers. And we're going to just genetically engineer our kids to be born with bigger feet, and then they'll all have great, fantastic mathematical there you ability. Go. There you go. Yeah, and there, a kid that has gigantism would, of course, have naturally good mathematic abilities, and somebody with dwarfism would have terrible mathematic abilities, mm. according to the epidemiological mm. data. Exactly. Right. So anyone with half a brain cell, after me just giving that explanation, is going to look at you and go, well, that's fucking ridiculous. It's obvious you've got a spurious correlation there. However, that's what these fucktards are throwing at us when they're talking about this highly correlated data between this and that, whatever this and that might be, for example, cholesterol and heart That's disease. That's a big one. The cholesterol, heart disease, the meta-analyses on cholesterol and heart disease. What's funny is in, yep. in a lot of vegan yep. debates, they only reference these meta-analyses that prove the point that they're wanting to make, whereas there have been meta-analyses and there has been epidemiological data showing the complete opposite, that cholesterol has no effect on yeah. heart disease. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Cherry picking is absolutely rife. I mean, it's confirmation bias of the of the highest order. It's like, okay, what do I want to find? So let me collect all of the, all the available data from all the different meta-analyses and then ignore the ones that don't say what I want them to. How do we avoid not doing the mm. same? Because you do see sometimes people in debates, I see some fallacious arguments getting made, sometimes from the carnivorous folks as well. The non-vegans are guilty of some of the same tactics. People accused, um, yeah. for instance, uh, and I don't, I don't know if they're necessarily right because I didn't really dig too deep into this cresser Joe Kahn debate, but... The vegans were saying he was cherry picking. Cresser is guilty of the very same thing he said Joel Kahn did. Um, how can we make yeah, sure that we're yeah. not doing that and that we're actually representing the uh, the true highest order of um, yeah. you know, of data? Of, yeah. of, um, okay. Well, first of all, I mean, I love the word fallacious, Tristan. That's a great word. That's what she said. <laughs> fallacious. <laughs> yeah. Second of all, basically. It, it, it's a little bit about attitude before you even start. If you want to consider yourself to be scientifically minded, if you want to consider yourself to be a scientist, it is your responsibility as part of what is the scientific process. It's your responsibility to set a hypothesis before you start investigating. And then it is your responsibility to falsify that hypothesis if you possibly can not to confirm what you already believed before you started okay if your goal at the outset is to confirm something then you are actually being a pseudoscientist pseudoscience is about um, confirmation bias it's about pulling the wool over people's eyes it's about saying words like hierarchy of evidence and high level studies and and, you know, vastly correlated and, you know, 
this is absolutely clear and you know all this kind of these kind of non-scientific trying to get trying to get the audience to be the correlation equals causation yeah i mean i think we've dealt with that one already with the with the shoe size yeah, yeah. Um, example with those children um at the end of the day that's it and then what they'll do is they'll say ah yes but what we're going to do is we're going to adjust the data for um confounding variables which is a mathematical chop suey or kung fu or whatever you like um whereby they make an attempt to extract out of the multifaceted um, phenomena that you're looking at, they try to take out the effect of one thing on another. So, for example, what they would do is they would measure the shoe size of all the children in our study and go, okay, there's clearly a correlation between their age and their shoe size, irrespective of the mathematical ability. So what we'll do is we'll, we will adjust our data set to, to, to reflect that, to make it more valid. Except that the problem with that is, how do we know how much of the size of the foot thing is attributable to their age and how much of it is attributable to their mathematical ability? Well, because this is a, ris a ridiculous example, because this is a, 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 something I just made up, we know the answer to that question. Okay, we know it's all about their age and nothing to do with their yeah. mathematical ability. So it's a hundred zero. With different relationships between different other variables out there in the marketplace, it might be 60-40, it might be 50-50, it might be 30-70 or any other combination of numbers that add up to 100. There is no way to determine what that level is. You, The, the way I try and explain this to people is once you've baked the cake, you know there's eggs in it, but you can't get those eggs back. You can't take those eggs out and say, here's your cake without the eggs in it. Basically, when, when you look at it, one of these studies and it says, we adjusted for covariates, what you can do in your mind is cross out that line, we adjusted for, and you can enter the following statement. We collected a bunch of data, and then we ignored the data we collected. We threw it out. And we made up some other data to suit ourselves. We fabricated we some data. We removed the data that didn't, what that says. likely didn't suit our hypothesis, which is what happens a lot. That's it. We removed the data that didn't suit our hypothesis. We ignored the data we actually collected, and we tweaked it. We adjust. I mean, hello, science is an observational task. You set a hypothesis. Your responsibility is to falsify that hypothesis, so you design a study that is capable of debunking your own hypothesis. Then you collect the data and you report the data you mm. collected. That's what science is. Pseudoscience is you go through that process, you collect the data, and then you fucking you ignore the out. data no, you that collected. Fit. That can't be right. Let's get rid of that. Yeah, yeah let's just tweak this one. Yeah, that doesn't look good, does it, Tristan? We'll get rid of that one and we'll put this one here and yeah, there. And it's a natural human, it's a natural human looks good. tendency <laughs> to... Uh, to not want to be proven wrong, which yeah. is, you know, a lot, in a lot of regards, actually the scientific no, method is contrary to human nature in many ways. You know what I'm saying? Like humans, we do not want to be proven exactly. wrong many times and uh, people will strive to um, to maintain an illusion. And we, I, we see this in science all the time with the cholesterol hypothesis and, uh, you know, sugar being blamed uh, or sorry, sugar uh, being exonerated with saturated fat being totally to blame for all heart disease and all death and all uh, all these bad things we see today. You know what, Bart? Your your video's frozen. You want to refresh your video or like turn off the video, turn it back on? Yes, that should be fine. Yeah. Um, I haven't had a stroke. It's all good. I'm still here. Okay, let's uh, turn the video off. Da, da, da. Turn the video off. Because <laughs> it just looks at me when I click yeah, turn video yeah, off. You've been static off. for about a minute there. But you, you, I didn't want to. Uh, uh, take your off. Maybe we just reestablish the call. You want to just hang up and call back? All right. All right. Sure. Oh, hang on. Let me see. Now it's going to turn off. There you go. You're coming back. Let's see what happens here. Come back to us, boys and girls. Come back to us. Where you at, Charlie Brown? Come back, Charlie Brown. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Skype. Okay. Waiting, waiting, waiting. 
let's try to reestablish oh, well, what... Let's reestablish the call. Yeah. I'll hang out right, and I'll call you right back. Let's see how this works. We coming back. There we go. Hi, Bald man girls. back. All right. Bald man back. <laughs> Bald man back. So um, yeah. So all right. That was a great uh, explanation there. So epidemiology. You often see meta analyses of epidemiological studies. You hear that? We've got a chicken invader yep. somewhere. That's weird. They never do that. Hold on. Hey, everything okay? Ariana, chase the chicken out. I think a chicken came into the kitchen. Sorry. My, he wants to be eaten. Our slaves are just... We need to train the slaves better. I don't know what to do. These poor... These chicken slaves are just... I don't know. We need to beat them more and abuse them more, I guess. Uh, complete fucking bird brains, to be fair. I think it's in the kitchen, babe. Or, hey, while I'm thinking about it, man, I have got to say I... Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed your discussion yesterday with Douchebag Rider. Um, oh my, I, I, I have not laughed so much in days. I've been waiting for that to happen hilarious. for years, Bart, and you know, it just it, it came on my plate, and I just, man, it's like how can you how can you turn that down? So I was so happy that that got to go down. Um, yeah, Durian Rider, he is a notorious psychopathic predator who's been essentially harming people uh, as much as he possibly can using his diet, uh, his advice on life, his, uh, his advice, you know, advising men to sterilize themselves at a young age. Many of them end up regretting it later on. So yeah, uh, Durian Ryder, uh, not a single shred of guilt for completely smashing that guy and telling him exactly what's going on because he is a ruthless psychopath. And uh, thank you for, yeah. for tuning in. I saw you in the chat yesterday. Everyone gets stoked when you pop oh. into my chat. Cool, cool. No, I loved it. I, I, I thought that it, you absolutely demolished him. And it was, he, the thing is, he's so fucking stupid. He sat there with a smile on his face and he, he did not even know what the fuck was going on, Tristan. It was so funny. He thought he was doing well. Well, that's, he's, he's very delusional. And that's, you know, it's, it's sad how somebody can be so delusional, but it's also, I mean, I, I have no sympathy for somebody that unapologetically harms people and when confronted with the harm he's doing people smirks into his you know smirks into his own lap and kind of shakes his head and says oh yeah whatever whatever it's all good they did it mm. wrong you know your teeth falling out you losing yeah. your period it's just it's normal it's it's okay we should all lose our teeth at 30 years old it's insane yeah have some carbs right. have some well carbs. how about um mm. the advice to vegans of not don't don't uh, supplement b12 don't supplement with any fatty uh, fatty acids, no essential fatty acids, no B12. Yeah, I, I nearly fell off my chair when he said that. That is so dangerous, man. Ooh. And you can, I mean, maybe that's how he keeps the, uh, he keeps it. I like how he, at the end, he's like, look how hot my girlfriends are. My girlfriends are hot. Um, maybe that's how he keeps the hot girlfriends under the wing is you keep them, uh, you keep that brain good and shriveled. And, uh, you, uh, get them eating yeah. like 30 bananas a day as a, uh, as a grooming technique, but that. Yeah. And you. And you flick green, and you flick some more green, and you flick some more green, basically. Yeah, it's sad, man. It's really sad. I mean, she's a 19-year-old girl. He uses her account to go comment yeah. on the video, too. And, um, yeah, he gets called out for all his sock puppet accounts. He's a real he's a real dangerous guy. And, uh, yeah, so yeah. to the uh, – most people really enjoyed it. A few people were like, you were too hard on him. And I uh, totally disagree. No, the guy deserves guy. every bit of it. And there's not – you know what? To the vegan audience, too. There's not a single other vegan that that I would you know go in like on that. I mean, I've got I got sympathy for guys like Goji Man. I've got sympathy for I mean, who else is out there? I mean, they're, they're, Goji Man's top of my list because he uh, was making some strange claims recently about bald men, um, which maybe maybe Shit. we can talk about that too. Did you see his uh, Did you see his community post where he said that bald men, two men who may have or may not have been bald, uh, allegedly contacted his school and tried to get him in trouble at a school did you see this mm. yeah. yeah i i yeah. Uh, well he said he said one of them was bobby okay so maybe <laughs> it was me and bobby and not you and bobby maybe he left you out of it well who knows yeah. who knows I don't know. yeah so yeah just just yeah. again if you guys didn't see the durian writer uh debate yesterday it was just a podcast it was like a uh, it was like talk radio basically but it was like morning radio show almost that's just kind of what it felt like <laughs> If you didn't see that, um, yeah. I did say in the beginning, uh, Goji Man, none of my audience 
as far as I know, is trying to mass flag your channel like you've sent your audience to do to mine. None of my audience is ever trying to get you censored. None of my audience has any idea, as far as I know, right? I can't control everybody, but they have never uh, been told to go to your school and try to get you in trouble with your teachers. I believe you have a right to have a YouTube channel. Goji Man, I don't want to see you off of YouTube. I want to see you come back to Team Humanity and stop poisoning people with this vegan diet. I want you to get well. Uh, I have nothing against you. Goji Man, you're welcome to come on. Um, you know, nothing against you personally. It's just the ideology you're pushing. Um, I find it dangerous, and I believe that it is uh, very misguided. So that's all i got to say about that. Um, awesome. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, back to the, uh, the, the chickens distracted us, and uh, the, the sound of roosters just makes us think of Durian Rider. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, back to the, uh, the interpretation of studies. Epidemiology, we talked about that a little bit now. Mm -hmm. um, yep. We're looking at, when you look at epidemiology, a lot of times in nutritional epidemiology, how might nutritional epidemiology studies uh, be conducted? And um, when somebody says, well, there's a study showing, for instance, that uh, low-carbohydrate diets increase your risk of death. This was a popular one recently, right? The mainstream media picked okay. this up. Do you do you remember that study in particular? I forget who put it out. Yeah, it might have been Lancet. It might yeah. have been the Lancet study. Um, yeah. How are yeah. studies like that conducted? And when we hear about these epidemiological nutritional studies, uh, what are we really hearing about? What are we looking at? Okay, so I mean, the first thing I would say about those kind of studies is that first of all, we are still looking at correlation data. Okay. We're not looking at a mechanistic study. We're not looking at a, a crossover trial. We are looking at two subpopulations of people who are supposedly drawn from the same overall population. We're splitting them in half, and half of them are in one category in terms of their carbohydrate intake in this case and the other half of the people are in a, in a different category in terms of their carbohydrate intake. So there's the first source of error, and that is that most of these studies are conducted by going to the, the participants of those studies and saying to them, listen, fill out this food diary, tell us what you typically eat. Yeah, what? so like if you if you were to go to somebody's door, random American off the streets, uh, or yeah. you know, I guess if you're going to their door, they're not off the streets. But if you're going door to door to every <laughs> random American in the suburb of, say, Southern California, and you ask them, "What are you eating? How much sugar are you eating per day? How many cups yeah. of ribs do you eat per day? How many cups of steak or of animal fat yeah. do you eat per day?" Uh, yeah. That's that's basically yeah. what they're doing. And if if you happen to knock on Eric Berg's door and ask him how many cups of green leafies he eats, that'll be an interesting one too. I wonder if he's decreased now. Yeah, but... I wonder if he's decreased because when I talked to him, he was really nice and uh, um, he, yeah, he, he seemed open to the idea of perhaps the plant toxins being an issue. Um, I'm gonna have to get get back in touch with Eric Berg and see if he'll have me on again to talk about some of this stuff because I really want him to augment that. Yeah. I really want him to to admit that it's not the best way for everybody or perhaps anybody. It's... If he's going to balk on you on that one at all, just maybe um, give him the, uh, the, the the N equals one naturalistic observation. Give him McDougal. So this is what happens if you eat the greens your whole life. This is what he'll do to you, my friend. <laughs> oh, how was that, man? Shit. That was a crazy thing. Man, that was that was painful to watch. It really was. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to make a video response, but no. I, I don't know. Sean Baker did a great video response to that. If you guys want to check out... Uh, Sean's response to Dr. Yep. McDougall. He did a very compassionate response, yep. and I think it's uh, I think it's important that we aren't uh, balking at these people and mocking them and laughing at them for uh, the degeneration that we're seeing. Um, it's it's dementia sucks, man. Like my uh, my mom's father just passed away yesterday, um, and he had major dementia, and uh, he wasn't. I don't know. He it pushed away everybody in his life. It wasn't really an easy thing. So. Um, you know, uh, yeah, dementia is no joke, and it's no fun to be around in your family. I'm really sorry about that. Yeah, thanks. I, you know, I actually, I, I, um, I didn't know him very well, so it's you know, they, he and my mom had a very strained relationship. But you know, I mean, uh, dementia, emotional uh, trauma, 
family trauma, these things do tend to be correlated too, right? It's not just diet. Um, there's other aspects to it. Mm-hmm. You know, our relationships are really important. I think, um, you know, dying, dying yeah. alone and uh, pushing everybody away around you is, uh, it's, it's not a good way to go and it's not a good way to live. So take care of your friends and family, guys. No. Yeah. Feed the meat. I just had to holler to Jessica oh, to get her to quiet. chase these chickens off. The chickens are surrounding. Oh, there you go. They want, they want food. Oh, you're under attack. They're all under instructions from douchebag rider. <laughs> yeah, the, the head, the head rooster sick them on me. So, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So we've got the error introduced by asking people what they eat. Okay. Write this down. People will tell lies about what they eat. Okay. So there's, there's the first, um, invalidation of your, of your data set. Um, then the next thing is they'll say, okay, they will use a, a form of granularity. And what they will do is they will put their entire population of people into what's called bins. And it will be quartiles or quintiles or deciles, which are fourths or fifths or tenths of the overall population. And then what they'll do is they'll look at the highest carb intake decile or quartile or quintile, whatever they're using. And then they'll take the lowest one, for example, and they'll compare those two things, those two granular categories. So it becomes a categorical. It's no, no longer even a, a continuous variable, which is going to introduce more error to the statistical analysis. Necessarily, it has to. And then what they'll do is they'll say, okay, let's look at all-cause mortality, which is dying for any reason, whether you're hit by a bus or whether you get cancer or whether you have heart disease or whatever it is, after your observation period, which is an arbitrary set period of time, five years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever it is. And then you go, okay, at the end of my, let's say it was a five-year observation period, my people who eat a lot of carbs, um, let's say there were uh, a million of them at the start and 999,999 of them are still alive after five years. Okay. Then you have your lowest carb intake and you go, oh, look, 9,999,998 9, of those people are still alive. Mm-hmm. So, now what we're going to say is this. Our study showed that the risk of dying from all causes on the low-carbohydrate diet was twice the risk on the high-carbohydrate diet. And in some of these... Can you see what we did there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what's funny too, when you look at some of these studies, like the... um, the groups that they call low-carbohydrate, they call them low-carbohydrate because they said that on their questionnaire they ate a certain amount of fat, right? I mean, it's like the way that they, the way yeah. that they break up the groups can be so sketchy, um, and it just really does not, um, it doesn't really add up sometimes. And they, they said um, that low carbohydrate, or that high carbohydrate, uh, low carbohydrate intake was like 100 grams, and, uh, or like 150 grams or something like that, which is definitely not true. Yeah, that's not low carb, is it? Mm-hmm. No. 150 grams is low carb, you know, wow. No, no, it isn't. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's another thing that they will do as well to pull the wool over your eyes is, is say, you know, this is a low carb diet when it's not. Um, and then the other thing that's really interesting is, even though we've actually misrepresented that data set massively by saying there's twice the risk of dying in the low carb group, Actually, it's not. A, it's not. Well, it's, the relative risk change is a hundred percent. Okay, it is twice as likely if you represent from this group than that, given the data that I just arbitrarily made up. Mm-hmm. However, the real difference, the absolute risk difference between those two groups, is one in a million individuals multiplied by the number of user follow up which is five in this case. So actually what you've got is a difference in mortality of one per five million 
person years. Another way of saying that is the real change in risk is not 200% or 100%, whatever, how you want to describe that. The real difference in risk is two thirds of five eighths of seven ninths of fuck all. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what these, these epidemio diddly dilio logical studies show. Typically they show absolutely no sort of effect whatsoever that's remotely useful to any one given individual in the marketplace throughout their lifespan at all. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. For example, <coughs> oh shit. Huh. It must be that lack of carbs that's doing that. <coughs> excuse me. So, um, I think they worked out the life span expectancy in the um, statin situation. And it turned out that the actual change was less than one day over a 20 year observation period mm -hmm. for an individual person, less than a day. And then you've got people like Asim Malhotra coming online and saying, well, actually, when you interpret this data correctly using real risk ratios, instead of this bloody nonsensical relative stuff, um, that's why he's saying a statin will not increase your lifespan, not by one single day. And I think Ivor says the same thing, and that's the reason, is because actually the change in risk is so small that they have to express it as a relative change in order to make it look like they've got anything whatsoever that's worth publishing and putting out to the to the marketplace as a, as a yeah. study. Yeah, so the relative that, risk versus then, absolute risk, that was a big thing in, uh, in the, uh, <clears throat> the so-called debate with... Uh, Frank Tufano and a Vegan Gains, Mr. Vegan Gains, uh, the savior of veganity. And uh, yeah, I think that's important for people to understand because it didn't get explained very well during the debate there. Um, do you want to just uh, rehash that one more time just to uh, just so that the, the, the yeah. relative risk versus absolute risk is very clear because that does come up quite a bit in debates with, with the, uh, the Vegangelicals mm. online. <clears throat> Yeah, it does, absolutely. So just to rehash, I'll give you the same numbers again, just so as not to confuse it. If I have two populations or subpopulations, each of which groups contains a million individuals at the outset, and I follow those two million people or a million in each group for a period of, let's say, five years, and at the end of my observation period, in the high carbohydrate group, one of those million people died. And in the other group, the low carbohydrate group, two of those one million people died. What I can now do is say I've got five million person years of follow up here. So this is absolutely highly, highly unlikely to be due to chance. And I can tell you what, you are twice as likely to die on a low carbohydrate diet. And that's what these epidemiologists are doing. They are lying to you, okay? Because the actual change in risk is not 100%. It's one in five million person years of follow-up. It is so minuscule, it's not even worth looking at as a, as a change in risk to, to any intents or purposes that's utilitarian to any person in the marketplace at any time. It's nonsense, and it's a way of getting... A publication because at the end of the day that's what academics are required to do they are required to publish data yeah. and so that's a way of making it look like they found something really significant wow twice the risk of dying <laughs> so i mean we're seeing how, how yeah. many ways of error I, or i see multitude of ways that error can enter in with epidemiology first of all you have it's a questionnaire people aren't honest yeah. second of all you have it's yeah. a questionnaire people are really stupid uh Third of all, yeah. you have people's memories just freaking suck these days, too. People have no memory of what they ate. People don't even remember what they were doing five minutes ago. Nonetheless, what they've eaten over the mm. last week. Then you have the measurements are kind of weird on some of these questionnaires. How many cups of red meat did you eat this week? I mean, how do you even measure that? Mm. Uh, then you've got how, the, how they're worded, right? If you read some of these studies, the way that some of the questions are worded are very misleading as well. And anybody who studied propaganda, uh, polls, Gallup polls, stuff like this, 
these are tools not only for <clears throat> gathering data, but also tools for influencing people's thought patterns and behavior. So if you know how to write a study, if you know how to write uh, a yeah. rather a, 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 um, a food frequency survey or questionnaire, you know how to use language in order to get what you want if you're half intelligent and know anything about human nature. So I, there's a lot yeah. of error that can come in there. And then on top of that, you you've bet. got the relative risk versus absolute risk, which is so easy to confuse people with. Um, it just seems like epidemiology might not be the top of the pyramid of a hierarchy of evidence as uh, you know somebody who can do a quick Google search and find an infographic from some ideologue to back up their uh, claims would assume. Yeah. yeah. And then at the end of all of that, what we basically have is a pile of horseshit. And then the authors will often make a statement that says that, um, therefore, on the basis of that finding, altering your carbohydrate intake upwards will half your risk. Well, let's get back to the fucking shoe size example, shall we? We are looking at an association. We're looking at an association that's completely made up anyway because people tell lies and because all of the things that you've just said. Um, and they're saying that this is a causal relationship. Have you got those chickens under control? That was me today. Yeah, the chickens are under control. I just, I need some, uh, I need a little bit of... Uh... My, my steroids. My wife's got to bring me my steroids. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. My, horm yeah. my exogenous and, and hormones right here. Yeah, yeah. Don't forget the uh, the flamethrower that you need as well to deal with the uh, the uh, the poultry militia or whatever they are. Yeah. No, we, we need to get them uh, shock collars, and we can use behaviorist training to uh, um, to make sure that they don't come in. Yeah. Just make sure you word the questionnaires properly. Yeah, exactly. How many how many bugs did you eat today? <laughs> okay, that's uh, a <laughs> thousand. Excellent. Do you have cancer? Oh. <laughs> Highly correlated. <laughs> uh -huh. You can always trust the chicken's yeah. answer. So, uh, I mean, I guess that's that's all of that in summary uh, is step one on how to interpret the literature. If a vegetard comes at you with epidemiology based on correlations... Okay, the, the debate is finished. You win. They have nothing but a pile of horse shit. It's not science. It. It's not even close what to science. What happens when they, they'll never they'll admit, admit it. it? They'll say, no, no, this is good studies. I don't care about the mechanisms. I don't care about the mechanisms. Look at this. This is epidemiology. Oh, no, it's beautiful. It's the hierarchy of evidence. Yes. So what I suggest in that situation, what you do is exactly what I did with so-called Dr. Ricky. And that is to so-called rage quit. Yeah. Or to put it another way to say, Ricky, we are done here. We are finished. This discussion is over. You are an idiot. Well, what's, what's a good question that you Goodbye. could ask them to, to get them to kind of expose their own inanity there, right? Like they're using epidemiology. Um, you know, uh -huh. I mean, it's, it's very easy to dismiss when people are educated. But their audience, the, the, the problem mm. is these guys' audiences, let's, let's face it, they're not the sharpest tacks in the drawer. Right, people that are following mm -hmm. Mike the Vegan, people that think that Dr. Greger is a god, are not exactly the uh, the most intelligent bunch. So they they readily will say, Bart K. Rage quit. He left the debate. He they'll say he cucked out. They they love to use that one. Um, you know, yeah. like when yeah. I uh, when I debated vegan gains on the ethics of veganism and he continuously would hit this wall of not being able to justify or ground his ethics and morality in an objective scientific worldview which he was proclaiming was the basis of his reality and his worldview he couldn't ground his ethics in it because he kept saying um he first of all he couldn't even you can't ground logic and reason in the physical world logic and reason are non-physical things that are outside of physical reality so he kept coming up against this and i showed so many times mm. that he couldn't ground his reality or any of his ethical claims or he even admitted in it that he couldn't even that he couldn't even prove that he's not just a brain in a vat that he doesn't even know if he's real or if his thoughts are real so yeah. it was just 
well, then the debate's over. And of course, you know, when I left, they uh, they they said, "Oh, Tristan rage quit. <laughs> Tristan rage quit too." So they, they they'll, they'll yeah, just say you're rage quit. They'll guide you that one too. Um, I'm gonna that's have it. to go look yep. at your debate with uh, Dr. Ricky. Who is Dr. Ricky again? I, I haven't seen this guy. Uh, Dr. Ricky. Dr. Ricky is Isaac Brown. The fact. The fact. The fact. The fact. The fact. The fact. Okay, I got him. Isaac. Yeah. Isaac, ask yeah. yourself. Okay. Isaac, ask yourself, Brown is Dr. Ricky. There's no two ways about it. I have high-level evidence to suggest that that's the, that's the Wait, case. Wait, do you have epidemiological um, evidence to, to prove that? I, I do, I do. Now, actually, what I do is I have a professor of um, linguistics and um, speech analysis who has had a look at that video and has also had a look at Isaac Brown and gone, that's the same individual with a voice modulator. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that's that's pretty high level. Um, you know, professors can be wrong, absolutely, but this professor is not wrong. That's pretty funny, man. <laughs> it's, it's, well, you know, what, a pathetic, what a pathetic playing. game to play, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is actually an individual who goes by the name Dr. Ricky, whatever, whatever, whatever. I won't name the person um, because it's already been done online by someone other than me, by the way. So to say I doxed him is not correct. I didn't. Somebody else did. Um, and actually the information that was provided about this particular medical practitioner in Canada was actually publicly available information, so still not doxing. Um, anyway, there you go. Um, there is a guy who was showing up on Richard Burgess's Facebook friends list under that name, or that was clearly that, that individual, yeah. that that identity out there in the marketplace. There is a doctor called Ricky such and such um, who is practicing medicine in the in the area of that that you know in Canada. I won't even give the area because whatever. Um, anywho, he's of Indian descent um, for what it's worth, um, and um, and he doesn't have ask yourself's voice. He doesn't have Ask Yourself's voice with a modulator and he doesn't speak the way that Ask Yourself does. He doesn't construct his logic and his sentences and he doesn't use the tactics that Ask Yourself uses. Um, it's, you know... Anyway, uh, Dr. Ricky is Ask Yourself. End of discussion in my mind on that one. As I say, high-level studies. Um, but tell me that. Uh, that's just funny. Um, basically, if you watch... It, there's a there's a video available on my channel that people can watch where actually it's it's like a, uh, a I think it's about a 90 minute um, analysis play by play that I go through and say here's what I was thinking here's what I was doing and you can you can watch it there or you can watch the you know without my comments version that's available on others sites if you want to um, but you'll get the same. What the I same think is interesting it, has basically. Dr. Ricky done any other debates other than that or is it just you? No, he hasn't done any other debates. What he has done is after um, Isaac spent about three months putting together the research off Google that he needed to put together a video about how atherosclerosis happens, um, he posted that and made two absolute clanging massive mistakes in it uh, that I was able to... Oh, it was about... Um, the, this is, I've got a video actually that, that explains that. Uh, on my on my channel as well, probably the, the simplest ways for people to go and have a look at that. It's called Response to Doctor Ricky or something, and there's a there's a on my screenshot. There's some nice green leafage behind me and stuff, and I'm wearing these headphones, and I think I'm wearing a blue t-shirt at the time. But there's, there was there were two very very major errors. One of which I'll give it to you is, for example, he said that your body will react to your own native LDL, which is false. That, that's that's absolute nonsense. How do we know that? How do we know that the, yeah. the body is not uh, that it's native LDL, meaning the LDL that your body makes exogenous or endogenous, right? Endogenous yeah. LDL. Yeah. How do we know that that's not adding to atherosclerosis yeah. and that that's not going to create a, a heart attack situation? It's it's about the person who's making the positive claim having to support that claim as per you know Isaac's rules of debating. Um, it's, it's not for me to prove that that's not the case. It's for him to prove that it is the case and he failed, which is outlined in my video. Um, but, you know, that's well worth a look and, and, you know, good for a laugh. And then funnily enough, uh, about two hours or so after I posted that video, 
completely debunking his three months of Google uh, research, um, my channel got flagged <laughs> by an individual who's you know, flagged for what? For copyright? Uh, um, I got flagged for copyright because I posted a copy of the discussion without my commentary on my oh, site, man. which I got from somebody else. Now, at the end of the day, actually, you know, how can I be guilty of a copyright breach for using a copy of a video that was illegally made in the first place? Oh, that's pretty funny. So they recorded the video off and, of and, their and Discord server and then posted it. Off their it. Discord. Okay, so you didn't even yeah, agree to be in a that. public debate. You just went in there and we're, we're no. going into battle. That's funny. Correct. That's really funny. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, in Canada, there's a law that says to record a conversation, you have to have the approval of one of the parties. And the reason that law was put in place was because the authorities wanted to be able to record people in Canada um, in a covert manner and say, well, we are the police, we are one of the parties to the discussion, and we give our consent for the recording. Okay, Big Brother is watching you. That's fine. That's the argument they were using. Dr. Ricky gave his consent. And I'm saying, well, okay, great. Who's Dr. Ricky then? Right. Show us Dr. Ricky. If, if Dr. Ricky is the real person that's giving his consent for this discussion to be recorded, let's let's see that. Let's let's meet Dr. Yeah, Ricky, shall yeah. we? Let's show him. Let's show, show his face. Just and, show us his and face. Then, talking with his yeah, and then he went And then he went to ground. Funnily enough, he went to ground completely. Gone. So I got one copyright strike for that. And then also that didn't work because obviously one copyright strike is not going to pull your channel down. Uh, so then also what happened on top of that is an individual flagged that video for breach of um, privacy and said between, you know, one minute and nine and one minute and 56 or something on the video, there's a breach of that person's privacy. Oh, that's too funny. Go on, get out of here. <laughs> Poor abused slaves. Yes. I don't know. Just disgraceful. Um, so, and then you, you obviously you go to the section of the video that was flagged. You go to the timestamps that were flagged, and there's absolutely nothing there that even mentions anybody, let alone breaches their privacy or in any way, shape. So, <laughs> desperate, desperate. You know, let's try and get this guy censored and get this guy shut up. Um, as quickly as possible. Uh, didn't work, Isaac. Bad luck. So, long um, story short, the copyright claim yeah. ended up getting reversed, and uh, there was there was no uh, there was a it was a fallacious copyright claim. Fallacious, yeah. yes, it was fallacious. So there you go. Wow. Fun and games. Right. Um, so I, I mean, I guess all of that comes us around full circle to how do you deal with somebody in a debate who refuses to accept that the hierarchy of evidence is horseshit. There is no empirical basis for the hierarchy of evidence. It's a dogmatically asserted consensus position of a subpopulation of basically what are pseudoscientists. Yeah, if somebody made an infographic and said, this is the evidence that I want to take as the superior evidence because this proves my hypothesis if I do that. So therefore, that's the best evidence. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. I mean, Dr. Ricky says it in, in the discussion that I had with him. It wasn't even a debate, it was a discussion. Um, and he said, you know, I would, again, you know, does this sound like Isaac Brown to you? Here's how I would frame this debate, he said, at the outset. He was like, that's orthogonal. Well, who, who orthogonal does that? Orthogonal to the fact, the fact, the fact, the fact. Yeah, yeah, he's like... Uh, the fact, the fact, the fact. Oh, you got a couple of super like, chats here. Uh, Philodies says, I've saved yep. about $1,000 on healthcare this year thanks to low carb, high fat. Um, awesome. Well, I don't see any evidence for that, Philodies. That's all I'll say. No. Do you have epidemiological no. evidence any, that can prove wrong? that? Don't, don't no. didn't think so. High level studies? Yeah, high, where's your high level studies? That's not in the hierarchy of evidence. Yeah. That's anecdote. And, and don't you know if you eat more carbs, you're half as likely to die? Yeah. Well, that's why, that's why I'm having so some, uh, some whole milk this? today. I'm just because I'm, I really want to keep that uh, the heart attacks away. So I drink the, uh, the whole milk for a little bit of carbs. Oh, get my, Tristan, stop get my lying to the people. We know you've got your steroids hidden in there. We know you have, yeah, right. mate. Get the syringe and Come on. squeeze it in there. Squeeze it in That's it. it. Yeah. That's, 
That's why you're so buff and huge. Yeah. My whole, my whole 165 man. pounds at my heaviest point of the day. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Funny yeah. as. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, so how do you deal with someone like that? Okay, a, a couple of ways you can do it. You can refuse to engage in that discussion any further and call it a day because actually you're not going to change that person's mind anyway, which is what I did with Ricky. Um, and called him some short words and um, some slightly longer words. I even used some uh, two-syllable words like retard, I think, a couple of times. was was one of the words that, that slipped out um, with malice of forethought because obviously, you know, that person is a fucking retard. Um, so, I mean, you can do that. You can just you can just exit yourself from that discussion and say, Look, you know what, this is a pointless discussion. Uh, when you want to do some study about science and understand what science is and how it, how it works, come back to me. Uh, but until then, you know, there's really not much to discuss with you. Um, you will not engage in, in the moot, which is, you know, if you want to talk to me about why a disease occurs, you need to look at the mechanisms of that disease, uh, not piss around for 45 minutes avoiding dealing with the mechanism at all, A, because you're actually not a medical doctor, you're Isaac Brown pretending to be one and don't have any fucking idea what you're talking about there anyway, and B, because even if you did, you know that someone like myself who actually does have a pretty good grasp of the mechanism here is probably going to slay you. So you can just say the fact, the fact, the fact, um, and use words like, you know, oh, that's not right, that's orthogonal. <laughs> no, it is. Um, all right, so... It, you guys were you talking about heart disease and cholesterol? Is that what the debate was? Yeah, we were. Okay. Well, it was supposed to right. be, but actually, it was about Isaac's high level studies of correlation. Yeah, yeah. of course. And you, and you, you can't and, let it go nothing, outside of that else. box, too, because if they maintain it inside this narrow little box, they've figured out some games and they've mapped out some games that they can play within that box. Right. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's all about framing it. And if they allow it outside of it, it all falls apart, it all crumbles. Same with the yeah. ethics debate. Yeah. It's like you ask them if they believe in objective morality, they say no, but then they want to impose an objective moral value on everybody else, even though they say morality is object is subjective. We just make it up. <laughs> it's okay. Well, that's it. So, yeah. so I think um, just just while I'm just while I'm yeah, thinking yeah. about it because it's on the screen right now, um, Durian Sticky Slimy Rider says Tristan can barely ride a bike. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> I, I have to ride a motorcycle. My 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 legs are so weak compared to Durian Rider. I have to ride a, a dirt bike That's instead it. of a bike. I don't even own a bike. <laughs> Sucks. So yeah. the, he also says Tristan's wearing a shirt to hide his roids marks. <laughs> roids marks. <laughs> That's it. Roids marks. Oh, <laughs> very and sticky slimy. Right? Yeah. So I mean, the the the, the vegetarians have these tactics, and they rely on using these tactics to maintain the control of the situation. Now, here's some advice that I gave to Frankie before he spoke to Richard last time, and. In this regard, I think he did really well, and I really want to credit Frank because I think he was very strong on it. And I said to him this, Frank, in any discussion that you're having with any person at any time, if you are asking the questions, you are in control. If, if you are answering someone's questions, they are in control. That's that's the game that vegan game Sorry. plays. So that what, if he gets caught, he immediately exactly. switches and he'll switch his line of questioning and say, you know, force a yes or no answer from a stupid question, and he'll try to give you a leaning question. Blah 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 blah. Yes or no, and you could even answer, and he'll still keep asking and acting like you didn't even give an answer. <laughs> so these are the these are the debates. Yeah. And he'll just repeat the question and say mm -hmm. yes or no. Mm -hmm. Admit you're wrong. Yeah. Or leave. Admit you're and wrong. Then, and then leave. if you try to give some nuanced yeah. answer, like because you know you want to actually give a proper answer. Won't let you explain it. He'll say, "I only will accept yes or no." So it's a it's a very childish uh, a tactic for debate. Uh, what, what's what's the status with uh, Richard? Is he's he accepted your debate yet? Is he going to debate you? Yeah, yeah, he did in January. Okay. When are you guys um, doing it? It's now March. When are you guys doing it? Well, exactly. It's now March, and he has repeatedly said on many public fora since that time that he will not debate me, not as long as his ass points to the ground. Mm -hmm. Um, and he will give all sorts of excuses for that. And in fact, he'll change his excuse every week as to what it is. Uh, one week, I'm too unhinged. Um, the next week, it's because I'm doxing people. Uh, basically, we all know what the reason that Richard won't debate me is. Everybody with any brain cells at all knows exactly why Richard won't debate me. It's because he knows he's going to get destroyed. He's absolutely fucking terrified of doing it. It will destroy his credibility. 
Um, he won't be able to manipulate me. He won't be able to bully me. Uh, he simply, he won't be able to use his tactics on me. It will not work. Um, and he'll have to rage quit. So um, you want to, you want to give him another call out? I mean, this is kind of does count as a call out, but you, you want to do another call out for this Richard? Does. I'm sure he might, he might tune in here. Oh, look, at the end of the day, I, I think Richard Burgess is an irrelevant little fuck. He's, he's a complete waste of fucking perfectly good oxygen. If he never debates me, that's absolutely no skin off my dick whatsoever. I don't give a fuck if he never fronts up. In fact, it suits me well because I can just claim the victory on moral high ground, basically. Also, to, to add to that, Tristan, it, it, I don't know if you've been following it, but uh, Richard agreed to a debate with Bobby Risto. But he's, you know, he's not going to um, no, be debating Bobby. But he's not going to do that. He's not going to do that either. And I'll tell you why he's not going to do it. Because I had a chat with Bobby online mm -hmm. and revealed that Bobby's scientific coach for the debate with Richard was yours truly, this reporter here, bald man, bad. Won't do it. So now he won't do it. Yeah. So now he's afraid of Bobby as well. Yeah, no, I don't think it goes anywhere. Uh, debating the so-called science of veganism with vegans really goes nowhere because, uh, well, first of all, these people have no idea how to read or interpret studies, right? I mean, the, most of them uh, hardly finished high school, never taken even a biology course in university. Um, now, you know, I'm no doctor, but I have taken university level biology. Um, I do understand you know, basic principles of science. I understand what science does and what science doesn't do. I understand what is uh, shit evidence and what is good evidence. And, uh, you know, these, these people, they don't, they really, they have no, uh, they got no footing to stand on, really. And what they do is they got some games that they play. They run a script. They run their, uh, uh, they're filibuster games, and it just it ends up being the same every time. So they pick they pick low hanging fruits is what they pick. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So if you find yourself in a discussion slash debate with a vegan, that's that's point one for me to remember, and that is, you ask the questions. So, and if if you are if you are asked questions, answer those questions with exactly. questions. Yes. And then you have that, then you risk the control straight back the again. And it's like the the thing is they don't want the nuance, they don't want the truth, and that's what becomes abundantly clear when you start asking the right questions in these debates. It becomes clear that they're not interested in what's true; they're interested in the appearance yeah. of winning a fake framed yeah. debate. They yeah. want to play so, rock 'em sock 'em robot debate. <laughs> so, for for an example, you, you would go, Richard would go, "Oh, look, this data is highly correlated." Here's what you can do. You go, geez, that's really interesting, Richard. Give me an idea. Um, what are the residuals around that trend line, please? Residuals? Huh? Oh, what do you mean residuals? <laughs> well, Richard, any trend line has an error of estimation around it. If you ever look at the mathematics, it's quite simple. It'll say a y equals some factor of x plus e, e being an error of estimation. In other words, any time you draw a trend line through a data set, not every data point is going to fall on any sort of line you might draw. There'll be a distance away from the line that each individual data point is, and then we can have a look at uh, two standard deviations of the spread of that data around that line and give us an idea of you know what sort of a predictor that line really is. So would you like to tell me about this highly correlated data you have? Uh, what, are the, uh, what are the residuals around the trend line, please? And if he's read the paper, it'll be reported there. Because he no, hasn't he read the, the paper. Abstract. He's just done a Google. He reads the abstract. Oh, and what he'll be doing is you'll see him. You'll see him. You'll see him doing this. And that's because he's waiting for his coach to tell him what to say. <laughs> coach Ricky, who's the coach? <laughs> I think Isaac Brown is probably his debate coach. Um, but in terms of his, uh, I have a theory as to who he's probably getting medical advice from. Um, and I would say it's, you know, and we know who it is, but I won't say. All I can say is that, that the, the person was, was mentioned earlier uh, as, as someone who might be thought about as a god. Uh, but actually, more likely, it's someone who looks like he's about to meet God, <laughs> to be fair. Uh... Uh, you know, I think well, you know, it's really what's, what's so sad from. is that you, know, you you see a lot of these people and they're so stuck on the ideology, but then you could see them suffering from it. You know, it's it's really hard to see people that are just beating themselves up 
because they're stuck in that worldview and they don't want to see outside of it. Um, you know, I mean, guys like, um, I don't know, for some reason, Dr. Greger comes to mind as somebody who's not the most uh, healthy looking advocate of a vegan diet. We've got Dr. McDougall comes to mind. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of these people, you know, I mean, guys like, I mean, Goji Man, I mean, he's clearly suffering, you know, I mean, making these delusional posts saying yeah. that, you know, uh, Tristan and Bobby are, are calling my teachers and they try to tell, tell YouTube on me and, you know, just these, you see these people suffering in their personal lives, in their physical body, and it's just, it's not, it's not fun to watch. And, you know, it is something good to point to sometimes to warn people, look, this is what happens when you restrict the most essential foods from our diet, you know, the most nutrient-dense foods that have everything you need, and it's in its most easily digestible form, and it doesn't have all those anti-nutrients that make it hard to assimilate, and it's the most, it's just the most nutrient-dense bioavailable high nutrient food you can get as animal foods and these people avoid them and they mm. eat freaking you know they're having grass juice right they think that their wheat grass juice yeah. and their celery juice is going to save them mm. you know got this guy like the the medical yeah. medium saying celery juice is amazing you just have to have the celery juice on an empty stomach and it's just going to cure everything and this guy goes on like oprah and shit and people believe him man yeah. and people stop eating meat and they do mm. celery juice instead and they wonder why their health falls yeah. apart it's really mm. sad. It's really, really sad. It, it is. It, it, you know, I, I should be careful here about saying I take no pleasure in poking shit at these oh, people. Oh, when they deserve it, um, when they deserve they it, do. like Durian Ryder yeah. is damn fun sometimes. And, uh, you know, some of these people yeah. do deserve to be called out. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. take pleasure in so seeing I, them suffer, that's for yeah. damn sure. No, I want them to come no. out. Neither. I mean, I... I like you, Tristan. I want these people to see the light. I want them to see that what they are holding dear, what they are believing, the bullshit that they have sucked up, and that they are now espousing to other people, is dangerous. It's fallacious. Fallacious. Um, it's fallacious. it's it's fallacious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's it's irresponsible. It's damaging. It's non-Christian. It's it's bad in every sense. It's I, I, and I just want these people to stop doing it. I want these people to understand that the whole framework of their ideology from the start onwards is that they are claiming to come from a scientific standpoint when they do no such well, thing. an ethical standpoint. They have ethical, been. Like, you kill less well, animals. Too. It's a lie. You're killing more animals. I'm about to go yeah. kill several animals right just, now. <laughs> yeah. They're just, I mean, the animals that those guys are killing are just not cute and fuzzy. Yeah. Right. That's, that's the, that's hey, the difference. It's okay man. to kill a mosquito. Have you seen the videos? A, a, a viewer sent me a whole series of videos, and I don't know if I'll be able to use them without getting a copyright claim. Shut up, chickens! <laughs> uh, but they're, they're videos of people shooting pigeons over wheat fields in England. Um, and they're just these guys with shotguns and rifles out there just popping off pigeon after pigeon, shooting dozens of them, uh, shooting rabbits, shooting foxes before the wheat thresher goes through. Because, you know, if you get too much, you know, big animals going through the wheat thresher, it's bad. The mice are getting ground up. But it's, it's okay, though. But uh, killing one cow or two cows, you know, if you have two steers... You kill two cows in one year, that's going to feed my whole family. Two animals that just ate grass. But they think it's sustainable to have soy processed into a freaking Beyond Burger with uh, you know, genetically modified fake myoglobin made from, uh, from uh, GMO soy. And that's sustainable, and it's sustainable to have a $30,000 hamburger grown in a laboratory using CRISPR technology and gene, gene editing. And these people trust these companies who are doing this stuff. But hey, you're evil because you give your kids cow cow meat and you uh, you steal chicken periods. That's it. It's like whoa, whoa, what? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even even dumpster diving chicken periods is that still yeah. wrong? Yeah, it is. It is because those chickens would have become babies. Uh, but uh, hey, abortions are great. Um, so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Bart, uh, I, going back to interpretation of data and studies. One of the big ones we see that confuses a lot of people, the biggest straw man against high-fat, low-carb diets, or even including meat and saturated fat in the diet, is freely shut up! <sighs> <laughs> hey, hold on, hold on. You were never fucking vegan! You were never fucking vegan! You fucking, fucking, fucking vegan! Fucking, I don't know! 
Ariana's taking care of them. These chickens are nuts. <laughs> They're going crazy. Um, so yeah, a cholesterol and heart disease, man. Let's let's talk about that. Maybe I can uh, give some of the common arguments that the that the vegans will give, and uh, and you can kind of help clear the air. And I'll play uh, I'll play devil's advocate here and be the uh, the vegan. So um, cholesterol is obviously causing heart disease. It is highly correlated with heart disease in every single study done by science. Uh, it has been shown and declared by royal decree um, by you know in the uh, the council of uh, of of Ansel Keys has declared that saturated fat is bad and it causes heart disease because cholesterol. Right. Okay. Uh, can you just give me an outline, please, uh, on what the connection between saturated fat and cholesterol is exactly? Well, there is a direct linear relationship. The higher consumption of saturated fat, the higher the cholesterol goes. Okay. And what's the mechanism behind that? The mechanism is... Um, uh, you do a Google search and you read a couple abstracts on Google and then you don't know how to interpret. So, um, yeah, no, what, what, what would the normal response be? What would their mechanistic response be? I guess they'd maybe say mechanism doesn't matter. I just want outcome, right? That's what they would say, yeah. That's what they would I don't say. Care about mechanism. Mechanistic data is low on the hierarchy. It doesn't matter why this happens. All you need to know is that this happens. These things are highly correlated. Yeah. So, so, you know, what's my point? Well, my point is, will you tell me why that happens, okay? Because saturated fat is like uh, triglycerides, and cholesterol is a high molecular weight waxy alcohol, actually, as it turns out. Uh, the two molecules are completely unrelated. They don't even look similar. So, I mean, you're telling me saturated fat and cholesterol. You're the one that understands all this physiology. So why don't you tell me what the connection between those two things is? Okay. Well, you can't? Okay. So now I'm in control. Okay, so then what is the relationship between saturated fat and cholesterol? Now, I do know that if I go on a keto diet, my cholesterol goes up, my LDL count goes up, my HDL goes up a lot, my triglycerides get really low. I usually have like a, I think it was a 0. 0.7 or 0. 0.8 uh, triglyceride to HDL ratio. Or maybe it was even lower. I forget what that was. Maybe it was a 0. 0.6. Um, I'll have to look again. But yeah, what's going on there? What are some of the nuances we need to be looking at? Is it just cholesterol high equals bad equals heart disease, or is there more to the story? There's, there's a lot more to the story, Tristan, as, as anyone that's ever seen anything I've ever said before will know. And uh, to those of you who have heard this before, I make no apologies. Um, this is a story that I will happily tell until my head falls off uh, because I believe it. Um, I believe that we need to get the right information out to people. They need to understand the mechanisms behind this disease process of atherosclerosis. And what they need to understand is that cholesterol plays no part causally in this disease process whatsoever. There is a correlation between, for example, LDL cholesterol uh, in the blood plasma and the level severity of atherosclerotic lesions, those things are quite well correlated. The higher the level of um, LDL cholesterol in the blood, uh, in general, the higher the level of both extent in terms of the air surface area of the of the lesions and also their severity and on a on a three tier level of severity of you know. so the so the assumption is often well because there's cholesterol in the lesion that causes the lesion that's what's creating it yeah. correct so again we've got a correlation between one thing and another therefore we have a causal relationship okay well again let's go back to the size of the feet of the children and their mathematical abilities okay so now we can stop training math teachers and we can start genetically engineering children with big feet that'll solve the that'll solve the problem with math mm -hmm. same deal here um, there are good, clear, mechanistic reasons why LDL cholesterol will be prevalent in someone who also has atherosclerosis. Uh, and that is because, for example, cholesterol plays many, many myriad roles in the human body. It's an absolutely vital um, component of our, uh, our metabolic pathways. Uh, there are so many things that cholesterol is used for, it's, it's, it's not even funny. One of those, just one of them, is that cholesterol makes up by weight 50% of every cell membrane of every one of the several trillion cells in your body. 
without sufficient cholesterol, your cell membranes will break down. Your cells will undergo apoptosis. In other words, they will die, uh, and your tissues will fall apart, and you will be dead very, very Where's quickly. Where's the most cholesterol to like, be fair. located in our body? Isn't that the brain? Doesn't the brain have the highest? It is in your brain. Yeah, your brain is kind of 60, 70 percent cholesterol by weight. So the brain gives us heart attacks. Uh, clearly. clearly, yes, that's that's what Having the problem a brain is. Yeah, I mean, where I'm getting to with, with the mechanistic thing there is this. Okay, if you have cells, let's say vascular epithelial cells, those, those cells that line the, the arteries, let's say you damage those cells physically somehow. They, they, they undergo a physical injury. Now, 50% of those membranes around those cells are made of cholesterol, the particular form of lipoprotein that delivers cholesterol to those particular kind of cells is the form that has the ApoB100 protein, which is what delineates it and, and it classifies it as a thing called LDL. The LDL cholesterol is being delivered to those cells because those cells need them to repair the physical damage, the injury that they have sustained. So, of course... If you are injured, you need some raw materials to repair those injuries. So your LDL cholesterol will go up. Is that the only reason your LDL cholesterol might go up? No. That's why you have residuals around that trend line. That's why there's an error there. Because there are many reasons your cholesterol might go up. And, and many of them are not related to any form of injury or any form of uh, disease process of any kind, actually. And as it is, the LDL that accumulates around the vascular epithelial atherosclerotic lesions is there to do a job. It's there to repair the damage. It's not the cause of the damage. It's not the cause of the disease situation. Uh, so lowering it is actually only interfering with your ability to heal. Mm -hmm. um, it's like saying, okay, look, anytime you cut yourself, uh, pretty soon after that, you're yeah. going to find there's a scab, so a scab made where you cut yourself. Uh, that's right, the, the, the scabs are associated with cuts, therefore the cause of the cut was the scab. So what we need to do to solve the situation of, of that is, is to remove the scabs. Well, that's real sensible, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a, there's a great vegan argument right there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's highly wondering. correlated. Every single time you cut well, yourself, you're going to find a scab Well, how about the correlations of low there? cholesterol, right? Hor correlations of low cholesterol, highly correlated with higher all-cause mortality. And when people do get heart attacks, which yep. people with low cholesterol get just as many heart yep. attacks as people with high cholesterol. Okay. And in that case, what we can do, Tristan, is we can make up another mm. bullshit concept which doesn't fucking exist, and we'll call it reverse causality. And then we'll say, oh, well, that's reverse causality, obviously. God, you're stupid. I Tristan, can't believe some of these that? arguments these people make, and they act like it's legit. Like, they, you, you can say that without feeling like yeah. an idiot. <laughs> it's, like, it's amazing. So, because, no, really, though, when, what's so, I think it's the most fascinating thing is when you have low cholesterol and you get a heart attack, you are so much more likely to die. I forget what the uh, percentage is according to the studies, but it is undeniably highly correlated. And it is far more highly correlated and far more uh, – yeah. Um, is far more obvious than the whole uh, um, so-called cholesterol. Uh, what is it? The, uh, the... Are you talking about a relative risk there or an absolute uh, risk there, Tristan? There you go. There you go. Well, those are, well, those are the eggs, uh, egg industry studies, yeah. right? Egg industry? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's another one, though. They'll, they'll yeah. throw that one out. Egg studies. The, the yeah. dreaded meat yeah. industry, this great meat industry conspiracy they talk about, yeah. which is which is freaking hilarious because it's... Uh, it's <laughs> uh, the, the meat industry... Oh, just go and take some more right. steroids. The, the meat industry, that, that argument is crazy because when you look at what runs the meat industry, it's it's these massive grain conglomerates that have taken over the small family farm and pushed this huge industrial agriculture system on us. And they want to remove the common rancher. They want to remove people from the land and give you the soy directly. They don't want to feed it to the cow anymore. So Tyson Foods backs the Beyond Burger. And these people will back Tyson Foods. But then they'll say, oh, you're a meat industry shill. It, it, it really makes no sense. But um, yeah. So, all right, so the cor the the correlation uh, between atherosclerosis uh, or I'm sorry, the uh, the presence of cholesterol and atherosclerotic plaque, we're not seeing causation there. But what might be 
ca- yeah. what might be causing this? I mean, uh, we we know that insulin levels, high insulin, insulin resistance is highly correlated with heart disease, inflammation. Mm. But I mean, what are yes. some of the mechanisms that you think are uh, yeah. we're seeing here, and what type of studies might you want to okay. see done to uh, to flesh this out? Oh, look, high level meta analyses is what we need. Uh, no. We don't. <laughs> what we need is good mechanistic studies done to explain the underlying pathologies in terms of let's get right down to the molecular basis of what's going on here. Uh, and let's use human tissues, not animal tissues. Uh, and let's have a look at what goes on. Now, it's really interesting when you start doing that and you start looking at things on a, on a mechanistic level, on a, on a systemic level as to, you know, what, what goes on. And what you find is a couple of really interesting things. Number one, I don't know if people understand this or not, but here it is. Atherosclerosis, heart disease, occurs in your vein, sorry, in your arteries only, never in your veins. Yeah, why is it gumping up in your it's veins? The same why bloody isn't it blood. in your wrist? Why isn't it in all these little veins everywhere? That's an interesting one, huh? It's yeah. it's the same blood, which carries the same cholesterol, which so called is causal. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So why is this not ubiquitous? Why do we only have atherosclerosis on one side of the vascular tree and not on the other side? Okay. Well, the reason for it is because what you need in order to uh, develop atherosclerosis is you need LDL particles containing the ApoB100 protein to be forcibly jammed in between loose gap junctions between adjacent epithelial cells. So for that to occur, you need a couple of things. First of all, you need loose loosened gap junctions that the the part where two cells will abut together, that needs to be somehow loosened up, made sloppy. How might that happen? Well, inflammation will do it. Systemic inflammation. Um, another way of doing it is to have hypertension, high blood pressure. Mm-hmm. Like a hole that'll do it. stretched out. Yep, what about bacteria? Exactly. Because bacteria, um, I've heard of, and then you have, a correlation between certain bacteria. Absolutely, yeah, bacterial yes, infections that's another one. Being correlated with it too. Yep. I guess you know that would be causing chronic inflammation. Absolutely. But, um, yeah. That too, but also you know some bacteria will spew out toxins that actually start breaking down the gap junction proteins yeah. and loosening things up as well. So it's like a multi pronged attack that way. Um, so okay, we have systemic inflammation which causes loosened gap junctions, but hang on, that would be ubiquitous. And we would still get lesions everywhere, evenly. We're still not doing it. It's still only on the high pressure side of the vascular tree. So there's your clue. That's the difference between the arterial side of the vasculature and the venous side. The epithelial cells are basically the same. The structures are basically the same. The microcalices on these cells are basically the same. They function basically the same way. One of these set of cells is under pressure, repeated pulsatile pressure from being exposed to the full pressure of the pumping of the heart. And to give you an idea of that, if somebody cuts through your carotid artery in your neck, uh, you can spurt blood up to six feet. So there's a lot of pressure going on in there. Uh, How do you know that, Barke? Uh, well, the... <laughs> well yeah, I saw you go visual with fair, there when you thought of it. Shady... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, no, I, I have a shady <laughs> background. Mark Mark Tristan, that's what it is. No, to be fair, uh, one, one, of the, one of the things I have done uh, in my uh, academic life um, previous to now is I've, I've held down a number of sort of high level high level consultancies uh, where people have paid me a lot of money to go and you know train them to do various things um, and one of those things that uh, a bit classified I can't give you too many details uh, about it obviously but I have dealt with uh, one of the world's most feared SAS forces um, in terms of their uh, survival techniques and hand-to-hand combat techniques and that kind of stuff. Um, 
along with their preparation, physiology, dietary stuff and, and whatever else. Um, and that's the New Zealand SAS. Basically, anyone you ask anyone in, in military circles, would you like to mess around with a New Zealand SAS force? They will say, no, thank you very much. Um, so I was involved in that for a bit. Um, so yeah, I, I've heard all sorts of stories, yeah. basically. <laughs> um, so there's, there's the answer to that one. That's how I know that. Um, where were we? We were talking about uh, the the blood pressure situation. Okay, so you're getting these lesions in the vascular tree only on the high pressure side. So that means we need loosened gap junctions, and we need enough blood pressure to force cholesterol particles in there, yeah. jam them in there. Okay. Um, however, that still doesn't explain the situation because still we would have lesions everywhere on the high pressure side and we don't. We have lesions in the bifurcations where you have a, a Y-shaped um, splitting of a, of a small, uh, of a large yeah. artery into two smaller ones and it takes off in two different directions. We get lesions around that bifurcation and in, in a very predictable uh, pattern that we see and is repeatable and happens all the time. Uh, if you've got a, like a curved piece of artery, like the aorta, which comes out of the top of your heart and curves around to feed the lower part of your body, you will find lesions all the way around the inside of that curve and not around the outside of that curve. But mechanism doesn't matter, Tristan. All we need to know is that these things are highly correlated, right, and that's yeah, the end of the it's discussion. It's so funny to want to so stop and not wasting. explore that. It's like, really? You're not interested in why this is happening in this specific spot and not where you would think yeah. it was or you would think it should be? That's insane that people it's don't want to look at that. I uh, know. Highly correlated. Correla yeah. Highly correlated, Tristan. Well, let's, let's back highly up. Let's just, yeah, let's look at this epidemiology Mechanism. again. So so why why is it happening in that's those right, yes. spots, Mr. Barkay? What the heck's going on? Okay. Yeah. Think about this. Put yourself in your mind on a rolling bus. Little bus or big bus? You're stood at the open... Uh, I'm, small I'm bus, more comfortable on the... Large okay. bus. Okay, whatever. You're standing in the doorway of a bus. You're holding onto the rail of the bus by the yeah. doorway. The door is open. The bus is rolling down the street. Your job is to jump off that bus at 30 miles an hour at the right time to land on the on the sidewalk in a one meter wide space between two shops you have two white painted lines on the on the sidewalk you you're rolling along at 30 miles an hour and you have to jump off the bus and land in that spot okay tough task yeah you're probably going to miss Hey, Not my, you, Tristan. You're God. Uh, if your, I had a skateboard, maybe. You know. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, anyway, for mere mortals, um, Durian yeah, Ryder could a do tough task. I don't think I could. Yeah, for sure. Oh, of course he could. Like a high level could. athlete yeah. like him could do um, it, not me. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, you know, he'd probably stop halfway to pick up a 19 year old and destroy her life on the way. Um, you know, whatever. Scumbag. Imagine that's your daughter, um, man. Imagine seeing I'm your daughter, like all. you know, under the wing of somebody like this. It's just uh, such a horrific thought. Um, take care of your kids, man. Stay around. Yeah. Raise your raise your children, fathers. Prevent this tragedy. Yeah. Have you seen that video where Jurian stood by the door of, of a, a car that got too close to a, a cyclist or oh, something? Yeah, you know, kill yeah. me, bro. Kill so me. Aggressive. I'm thinking. Yeah, man. Oh, I've seen a few of those videos where he's kind of getting in fights in the street and you know threw someone's cell phone on the ground. Yeah, uh, he one of those guys sued him, I think, and he what actually he got sued for something. And the court papers, the judge said that uh, he's a master manipulator, and he fake cried in court and was crying and trying to manipulate the uh, the court proceeding by yeah. crying, fake crying like a woman. Uh, man, <laughs> anywho. What I'm going to now ask you to do is put yourself yeah, back on that same bus. Like elementary school. Okay. Yep. Doors open in the same way it was before. You're holding on the same rail. You've got the same mark yeah. to hit on that sidewalk. But I'm going to slow that Thank bus you. down to five mile an <laughs> Thanks, hour. dude. <laughs> I'm all right. I can do it. Okay. So take that curve yeah. around that aorta. Okay. The blood that's going through that aorta, the distance that the blood on the outside has to travel 
is further than the blood on the inside. Therefore, the blood on the outside is traveling faster than the blood on the inside. That's why the lesions are on the insides of the curves okay. and not the outside. With respect to the bifurcation thing, when you've got the blood going through the large artery into the two smaller ones, it hits that middle divider and it swirls around. Okay, yeah. Yep, just like you see when it's in a river or something, when it means hit, the water hits a rock and you'll see it spin exactly around. Exactly that. Yeah. Right. Fluid dynamics. So what you've, there, what you've therefore got is you've got a much longer transit time of blood around that area because of that turbulence. It's not laminar flow. It's not swift flow. So there's plenty of time for that blood under pressure to drive those cholesterol particles now, in there. Why are they getting driven in there? Why do they stick? Because those gap junctions are loosened by the various different forms of physical injury, the yeah. physical inflammation, the inflammation caused by a mm. disastrous diet, uh, the inflammation caused by pathological intervention by bacteria and viruses and things, uh, and by the fact that we generally have uh, highly mm. elevated blood pressure, much above our natural levels, what about polyunsaturated uh, fatty acids? Because we're carrying seen, uh, too much. There was a recent study talking about the, com the composition yeah. of atherosclerotic plaque containing loads of omega-6 fatty acids in it. No. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, by the, the virtue of having double bonds, are inherently unstable. If you subject polyunsaturated fat to a number of different stressors, including pressure, yeah, light, heat, yeah various light, various chemical interventions with things like, oh, I don't know, glucose, for example. What you get is a, a double bond, which will actually mm -hmm. do that. It'll swing around itself 180 degrees under these chemical mm -hmm. uh, challenges. And that then becomes a thing called a trans I'm trans fat. vegan, so I can relate. Yeah, yeah. There you go. So it's a trans fat. It, it changes from a, from a, a one... Yeah. orientation to the other, boof, uh, and the result of that is that you get a trans fat, and trans fats are the most highly pro-inflammatory substances just about that you could possibly yeah, so put in you. transphobe, you're an admitted trans so, fat phobe, it seems, Tra trans fat phobic. Yes, um, yep. Oh, look, go, yeah. go to the literature and you'll, you'll find, you know, lots and lots of mechanistic studies that show clearly that trans fat is highly yeah. uh, inflammatory. Also, an omega-6, 3, 9 ratio that's out of whack. What do you think about, what about uh, fish oil also be pro inflammatory? a lot of fish oil pills, thinking that they're doing themselves good because, oh, the studies yeah. show that fish oil is good for me. Yeah. And then a lot of times it's sitting mm -hmm. at room temperature, uh, getting oxidized. A lot of times it might yeah. have been rancid when it was packed even. Uh, what do you think about fish oil supplements? Yeah. Yeah. Um, have a look at a discussion I had with Dr. Paul Saladino, MD, uh, about a week, mm -hmm. a week and a half ago. Uh, it's not the one that I posted yesterday or whatever about vitamin C, although that's a good chat. Uh, it's the one the week before where Paul and I were talking about uh, this, among other things. Um, and I sort of outlined to him the same thing as I'll outline to you now, and that is that in about, uh, I think it was November or December last year, 2018, um, myself and my lovely partner Pim published an article in the journal Nutrition. Uh, what we did is we took 12 uh, commercially available omega-3 supplements that we got from chemists around where we were living at the time, which was in the UK, so we went into pharmacies in the UK, uh, in the city that we were living in, and we said, according to the recommendation of the salesperson, uh, what omega-3 supplements should I take? We bought them. Uh, we, took, we used a very natty piece of kit uh, called a 1H spectrometer, uh -huh. a magnetic resonance spectrometry. And what that is is it puts the sample in a very strong electromagnetic field, which lines all the molecules in that up in a certain direction so they're all facing the same way basically and then you shoot a packet of photons at the sample at various ranges of frequencies and things the sample will then absorb those photons because that's what it does 
and then it would re-emit those photons at very set energy packets, depending on exactly what it is that's in that. Uh, it's a high level way of finding out exactly, even at very low concentrations, what you will find in these omega-3 oil supplements. Mm -hmm. What, what do you anyway, think? Of, what do you think about short. like uh, even uh, fermented cod liver oil? Do you guys do any of those? Because that's one of these foods that you know Weston A. Price Foundation recommends uh, fermented cod liver oil. I actually always liked how it tasted. Yeah. Never felt any negative effects from it, but don't really take it anymore sure, sure. because I'm, I'd rather just eat some swordfish or something. And uh, yeah. that, that's that's my take on it as well. Is that you should get your nutrients from your diet. Um, supplementing with anything, if your diet is adequate, uh, shouldn't be required. Shouldn't be necessary. Um, so I say that with the caveat that if you are and do choose a vegan lifestyle, for God's sake, take a B12 supplement and don't listen to fucktards oh like goodness. Jury and fucking I can't rider. believe Jesus. it, man. No B12 supplements. I mean, when you look at what happens when you get low on B12, it's literal brain shrinkage. Your immune system tanks. It's oh. just you're, you're totally oh. screwed. It is. Uh, yeah. That was hard for me to listen. I mean, I, I had to call him out on that one. That was just incredibly dangerous oh. and offensive. I couldn't believe it. Anyway, back to science. Yeah, yeah. Um, the PUFAs, so, the polyunsaturated yeah, fatty samples, acids. Yeah. Yeah, 12, 12 samples, 12 omega oil supplements that we tested. We fired photons at them. We found out exactly what was in them. Uh, and eight out of those 12 samples, so two thirds yeah. of them, um, we found basically a very, very dangerous oxidation product called aldehydes. Oh, yeah. Aldehydes will bind to lipid rafts, in other words, cell membranes. Uh, they will bind to DNA and basically screw up your DNA and basically, you know, in other words, they're mutagens, which then lead to cancers and all sorts of other things. They bind with all sorts of enzymes and, and screw up your, your enzymatic functions. And basically, aldehydes, nasty, nasty, horrible poisons. You don't want those in your body at all. They're completely unnatural. Um, in terms of having them in your body. Yeah, yeah like dietarily, we shouldn't uh, be consuming them at all. Now, would aldehydes, no. be, uh, would they also be in normal meats? Like if you were to eat meat, would you be getting aldehydes or fish, uh, rather, with the polyunsaturated fat? Uh, at, at, at much, much lower levels than what you're going to get in a commercially extracted uh, oil supplement that... It's a process that involves pressure, it involves heat, it involves chemicals, they even it involves smell. bleaching. They almost have like a rubbery smell, like a liquid plastic smell, some of these fish oil supplements. Yep. And uh, yeah, yep. they don't smell like I would want to eat them. Except, I got to no. say that some of those fermented cod liver ones do taste pretty good to me. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm neutral at best on those. I don't know if I could recommend them anymore. In the past, I might have recommended them, gave them to my kids in the past, but I don't find myself uh, yeah. eating them or wanting them anymore. Um, yeah. No, I, I certainly will uh, source all my omega-3 oils through the meats and fish and seafood and stuff that I'm consuming. Thanks. I, I, I've got, I've got I, some friends I've got some friends who even say that omega-3s might be uh, avoided for health reasons like that. You know, high omega-3 intake from a lot of fish could even be detrimental. You know, I had, uh, had Jack Cruz mm. on a lot back in the past. Um, and he always recommended before he blocked you. Yeah, yeah before he blocked me, he blocked me everywhere. We don't talk about that. I, I love you, Jack. You can come back on someday though, if you ever want to, buddy. It's all good, Jack. Yeah. Um, I do want to hear about your biohack of reversing the the weight loss gain, though. I want to see when that biohack ends. Um, so yeah, I ha I've got some friends like uh, uh, there's a guy named Matt Blackburn, and he went from being like a Jack Cruz aficionado saying you got to eat as much fish as you can, and he was selling DHA. Then he went to the opposite, uh, the opposite op uh, opinion, and he believes that DHA is toxic and that all omega-3 fatty acids are even toxic. I um, haven't mm, really looked mm. into the, uh, the reasons or the mechanisms that, uh, that he gives, but I'm assuming it would have something to do with the highly oxidative, um, the easily oxidized nature Probably, of it. Probably, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's one of these things. You do need a minuscule amount of omega-3 in your diet, it's easily subserved by eating a carnivorous diet. You don't need to supplement on top of that. Um, it's, it's one of these nutrients that you need an amount of, but too much of it is just as problematic. You know, it's not enough. And in the same way as, for example, vitamin C, which you probably would have learned about if you watched the chat I had with Paul the other day on that topic. That was an eye-opener. Um, 
This is the one that you yeah. released yesterday. The video you released yesterday. Okay. Yeah, I watched right. about the that's first right. fifteen minutes of it. It was fantastic. I think I left off. I started listening to it last night. Actually, and I, um, I fell asleep under my little red light, and uh, you guys were talking about uh, glycine, and um, you were getting into oxidative reactions and redox uh, redox potential and stuff like that. Yeah, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have yeah. to finish that today. So, so you guys listen to it. It's a good one. You are gonna have to finish. I that. shared it on Young my community is... page. If you guys go to the community page, you'll see the link to that, that one. Thing. Yeah, it's a good talk. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. So, you know, Paul is an absolute treasure trove of information on that kind of stuff. Uh, and he and I were just basically batting the ping ponging the ball backwards and forwards in terms of, you know, do I need to worry about my vitamin C status? Do I need to take extra vitamin C? And we and we 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 really took the rabbit hole all the way down to the bottom. Uh, I think you'll find so that's that's a chat that's well worth a, a watch if you've got yeah. an hour or so. I think it's an hour and three minutes. Nice. Uh, you know, including introductions and thank you very muches and stuff. So it's you know it, it's it's short, it's accessible. Um, some of the some of the speakers are a bit uh, a bit technical. Um, no, I don't think you guys go but, too far. Uh, I think you guys did a good job at bringing it back to yeah. the circle. You know, I mean, I'm not a, a biochemist, but well, I don't know. Sometimes it's hard to relate to the audience because I've been talking to a lot of the low carb docs for a while. So I guess I've gotten a uh, almost university level education just from talking to cool guys like you and. Paul Saladino and even some of these other crazy guys like Jack Cruz and stuff over the years and trying yeah. to figure yeah. out where people are right and wrong is it's it's giving me an interesting perspective. But I don't think you guys got too yeah. uh, esoteric with it. I think you guys did pretty good. Cool, thanks for that. No, I appreciate that because it's it's always difficult to know exactly you know where to pitch it. Um, so I just kind of any time we were talking about something sort of a little bit technical. I, I tried to, to sort of give a, an analogy if I possibly could just to make sure that we weren't losing too many maybe people. You guys but, have a good rapport. Uh, I'd like to see more with you guys together. Maybe I'd get you guys both on and I, yeah, can, well, we'll I can be the dummy yeah. asking the questions and you guys can help educate. We can bridge it for the audience there. Cool. I mean, and, and also there are, there are plans ongoingly still as far as I'm aware to have uh, further exchanges with Dr. Darth Vader. I mean, Dr. Garth Davis. He was pretty nice with um, you, yeah. That was uh, that was a good conversation. Oh, we, we were both just getting to know each yeah. other, and, and we, you know, we were just feeling each other out as well. I were. just can't believe um, it, that it, it, he goes just... to the ethical argument. You know, to me, it's like it's all right. So yes, you understand that there's nuance to this, and he was admitting some of the nuance, but then you could tell that it was just like, yeah, I'm, I'm never going there because I'm an ethical vegan, and it's um, yeah. I, I, I really want to see more with him, see where you can bring him. Yeah. Bring him out of the darkness, man. Yeah. Bring him back to the light. That, that's it. I mean, I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is, well, my intention is to engage him in what he wants to do, which is he wants to tell me about, you know, how he knows all the science and how all of this mechanism is and, you know, how it is that eating meat is bad for you and will kill you three weeks from Tuesday and stuff. And I just, I, I mean, I'm going to give him the opportunity to outline that stuff. And then, I mean, he knows this. I've spoken to him both publicly and privately on this exact thing and said, look, what I'm going to do, Garth, with my scientific training, with my history as a peer reviewer, I mean, I've sat on the editorial boards of three different academic journals in my life. Uh, you know, our job was when people sent stuff in was to go, there's Waldo, there's Waldo, there's Waldo, there's what, in terms of the errors. So I'm going to, I'm going to, Get him to, to paint me his picture, and I'm going to find the guy in the stripy shirt. That's that's no problem. I'm going to do that within minutes. Didn't probably. Charlie Brown wears stripy shirt. He does too. Yeah, he does. There we go. Bring um, it a full circle back to the uh, the cover image. Charlie Brown. You haven't the pro, you haven't Charlie, even said Charlie Brown one time this talk, man. I'm I'm, I'm kind of disappointed so far. I got to drop some some references there. Oh, you have to piss me off before I'll call you Charlie oh, Brown. Man, that's, that's not going to happen. I like you too much to piss you off. All right. Oh, go on, Tristan. You know you want right. to. Uh, bald, bald man, bad. <laughs> Tell me high level studies again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> high level studies. <laughs> and I'll say, listen, Charlie Brown, you don't know shit about dick. Around <laughs> dick. Oh man, yeah, shit and dick. Those are two words that shouldn't be used together very often. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so yeah, all right. So oxidative. Uh, Highly oxidative, uh, easily oxidized, polyunsaturated fatty acids, definitely a problem. What a fascinating study you did. Um, were, were any of those like cold extracted or, you know, the high, like the Nordic Naturals and those brands that are really highly recommended? Did you do those ones? Um, we picked, as I say, we, we got 12 samples at random on the basis of the recommendation of the sales rep in that pharmacy at that time. 
So as as a function of that, we generally got the bigger names. Uh, I'm not at liberty to disclose the exact uh, manufacturers, the exact products that we tested, um, mainly because the study was was a pilot study. It was a small sample size of only 12 different uh, products. There are many others available. Uh, let's do the BBC disclaimer. For Bellas, other products are available. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, you know, but as I say, we got, you know, big name products and two thirds of them were tainted with very, very dangerous aldehydes. That's crazy, man. Two thirds. Um, so, yeah, guys, yeah. think of that. Think twice before you go buy these expensive uh, supplements of DHA and EPA. And I, man, these algae extracted DHA and EPA ones were, uh, I would love to see some studies on those and see what's in okay. those. What I can tell you is that of the 12 samples that we tested, some of those were algae based. They were the worst. It makes sense. In terms of the older heights. It makes sense. Okay. So these these vegans that will say, Oh, I'm getting my I'm getting my DHA from algae oil, you know, or you know, this this kind of stuff. Um, that's ethical and vegan and great and you know, there's nothing to worry about. Well yeah, there is. They were the worst ones for elder heights, boys and girls. So Charlie Brown. There we go. We just got to give context to the, the cover image, man. I don't, some people are like, "Why is there Charlie Brown?" It's good grief works, but we need some some uh, we need some some uh, <laughs> some context for that. Uh, that's crazy, man. So um, yeah, and what other um, we, we were talking about that because we were talking about the buildup of atherosclerotic plaque and cholesterol yes. in the inflamed arteries. Now, what are some other things that we might be doing in our modern lifestyle that would be causing an inflammatory response, chronic inflammation, that could lead to such a situation. Okay. There is a substance that you will find in many food products. Uh, most of these are plant-based, and it's called oxalate, for example. Uh -huh. Oxalate will form tiny little needle-like crystal structures with calcium in your blood. Mm -hmm. So if you have a lot of oxalate in your blood, some of that will crystallize out into these sharp needles, which will then fly around in your blood and at some point come into contact with the epithelial cells and basically slice and dice them. That sounds nice. Yeah, so, so that can cause So oxalate, what are some high oxalate foods that are uh, maybe very popular out there? I, I bet uh, at least 10 out of the daily dozen from uh, you know, His yeah. Holiness, the Dalai Gregor, uh, would be in there. Yep. That's right. So leafy greens mm -hmm. are, are pretty bad um, offenders in terms of oxalates. Spinach is huge, right? Uh, spinach is huge. Um, sadly, unfortunately, coffee is not good in terms of oxalates. Uh, also, you'll find things like uh, potatoes and sweet potatoes and you know those kind of tuber-based things. Yeah. They're very high in oxalates as well. Um, rhubarb, you know, is up there. Yeah. Um, I think. Uh, uh, What's yep. that? Uh, the root um, uh, beets are pretty bad, I think, for uh, for oxalate as well. Beet greens really bad. Yep. yep. Kale. So someone said kale. Day, Kale's I mean, actually not high in oxalate, but it's just it's basically rubber. <laughs> it's like rubberized green. Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. not a fan of kale yeah. unless you really steam it and put so much butter and salt on it. But why not put that butter and salt on a steak? That's my opinion. Um, not exactly. a fan of kale. Yeah. I used to yeah. love spinach, though, so, man. I do like spinach. It's nice. The taste of spinach can be really good. So that's a disappointing one mm -hmm. for a lot of people who are on keto and who aren't sold on carnivore mm -hmm. or aren't, you know, maybe uh, convinced that you don't need any of those greens because spinach is so freaking popular. Yeah. Popeye. So uh, oxalate crystals, slice and dice the inside of your arteries with that, and then add to that a secondary effect of oxalate, uh, which is that it causes sulfur wasting. Mm -hmm which means that it will actually leach sulfur out of your body and cause you to excrete it. One of the things that is needed for slippery, slidey vascular walls that the blood will slip past easily uh, is a sulfur compound, and it's sulfur compounded with, you guessed it, cholesterol, actually, that, that does that. Mm. Uh, if you if you leach out all the sulfur, what basically then happens is the cholesterol becomes um, sticky. Wow. And and sulfated cholesterol. And now, when people say sulfated cholesterol, that turns into vitamin D. We're looking at sulfur yep. as well. So you might be 
trashing your vitamin yeah. D levels by high oxalate. I actually never thought about that. Correct. Wow. Correct. And then oxalate also has a direct effect on the mitochondrial function, mm -hmm. causing your redox potential to drop. Mm -hmm. uh, and anytime you drop your redox potential in your mitochondria, that has a direct causal link straight to systemic inflammation. Yeah. Wow. The reason for that is because all the pro-inflammatory mediators are all substances that are either active or inactive. When they're inactive, you're not inflamed. When they're activated, you become inflamed. Mm -hmm. The thing that activates these pro-inflammatory activators <laughs> is free inorganic phosphate. Okay. So for those of you that don't know some biochemistry, the energy currency of the cell is a thing called adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Uh, what happens when you need energy to do things, your cells will split ATP into adenosine diphosphate or ADP plus an inorganic phosphate. Mm -hmm. So then what your mitochondria does is it uses oxygen and hydrogen and reacts those together and makes water. And the energy released by doing that is used to jam phosphates back onto ADPs to reform ATP. So that's how that whole thing recycles. If you drop your redox potential in your mitochondria by poisoning it with, for example, oxalates or indeed statins, then what happens is the level of inorganic phosphate in your cell will build up because your ability to reform ATP is now dropped. That inorganic phosphate that's floating around in your cell is then free to bind with a pro-inflammatory mediator and activate it. Now you're inflamed. There you go. I got a question, and somebody else do this in the chat too. Um, oxalate, yep. right? Uh, now, Sally K. Norton, you know Sally Norton? She's done some really good talks on oxalate over yep. the years. She was kind of a, my first exposure to, uh, to oxalate. I'm going to have uh, to get her on the show soon because I know she does, does a pretty good breakdown. Um, I, cool. You know, I, I think that she's said before that coffee is low in oxalate, so you might have to correct her on that one. Um, but uh, that, that's not what I was going to ask about. Uh, glycine. She has mentioned before that yep. glycine can be converted into oxalate. She didn't get too deep into in the, in the information I've seen. Uh, didn't get too deep into the mechanism of how and why it would be converted mm. and if it could be a problem. Okay. So could, you, could high glycine intake possibly affect gly uh, oxalate production within the body because our bodies do make oxalate too. Yeah, they do. Our, our bodies make and generate our own glox, uh, our, our own oxalate. Um, in fact, probably uh, you know, 80% of the oxalate in your body is, is generated by your body in the normal course of events. There are a number of different substances that lead via various metabolic pathways to form oxalate. Uh, your body will usually then just excrete the oxalate in the urine. Um, it becomes a problem when the level of oxalate gets so high that you can't excrete enough of it in um, the time period that you've required to get rid of it. And then it, it has time to precipitate out with things like calcium and magnesium and iron and all these other things, basically, and basically biocolate these things, block them up, nutrient lock. Um, mm -hmm. which then makes those minerals unavailable to you to use for biological purposes because they're locked up with the with the oxalate. But also those will then precipitate into crystals. The most common problem, obviously, there is kidney stones. Yeah. However, oxalate crystals can form anywhere in your body, for example, in your blood to scrape the insides of your arteries like we were talking about before. Oxalate crystals can form in your eyes. That would suck that, right now. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, oh. I got I got floaters my whole life, you know, and uh, I don't I, often also, I don't know what floater what causes. Yeah, you know the little black spots. You're looking up at the sky and you're like, damn, like <laughs> there's something wrong with my eyes. I remember being a little kid and noticing that stuff. I wonder if oxalate might have anything to do with some of those visual disturbances we see in our visual did, fields. Um, did your mum never tell you to leave it alone, Tristan? Yeah, yeah. Is, 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 is it ma masturbation? Is, did they say that? The jerking it causes floaters. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. No. Well, I gotta eat more. I gotta eat some more grains. I gotta eat more grains. I gotta get on that thirty uh -huh. bananas a day diet so I can decrease my libido, that's man. <laughs> yeah. I did. That, that's what you want to do. If you look like I Momo. did stroke. I did stroke it a few times as a young man, though. I think you could be onto something yeah. there. 
<laughs> spent yes, some, yeah, spent yeah, some yeah, days man. as an eighth grader on the old uh, hey. on the old Kazaa plus 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 downloading them booby pics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, basically, I, I the the long story short on that one, I think, is that if if your diet is what was intended, the way you're designed, in other words, a sensible nose to tail, sorry, Frank, carnivorous diet. Whoa, did you just, um, wait, did you just plagiarize? Yeah, I did. I did. I'm sorry, Frank. I, did. I, I, I also yeah. searched beef liver DHA the other day. I know that's illegal. Um. <laughs> yeah, you can't be doing that. No, we love yeah. you, Frank. Just... So, you know, if you, if you eat a sensible nose to tail, carnivorous yep. diet, look, you're not going to have a problem with your amino acid profiles. Um, it, your body is a fantastic machine. It's able to deal with a lot of different insults very effectively. For God's sake, I mean, you can even live on a vegetar diet for a number of years before it'll kill you. So, I mean, it, yeah, your body is an amazing thing. Um, and if you looked after it properly, it would be an even more amazing thing. Mm. Are you hitting on me, dude? <laughs> like, you're, this, you're got, this got body. awkward. He just told me I got an amazing body. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So the um, the, the glycine. I didn't really mean you specifically. Actually, I, I mean. No, what are you saying? General, I don't have an amazing you are... body. Wait, what? Back up. Uh, of course you do. Thank... Hey, I'm asking. You, can't, you just can't win here. <laughs> I'm not gonna. <laughs> oh man, we got a couple super chats. Let me read some of these. We can go get back to it. Uh, super chats. Uh, what would you guys recommend for anxiety slash high cortisol? Says. Nitter gritter. You got any advice on that one? A sensible nose to tail carnivorous diet. Also, uh, Xanax. No, no I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, like lifestyle too, right? Like I know that you talk a little bit about grounding, and I'm a huge fan. You'll get outside, take a walk, 10 minute walk yeah. every few hours if you're at work in an office. Uh, avoid that artificial light when you can. Get natural sunlight when you can. That's a good one. Are you just plagiarizing Jack? I did. Yeah, yeah. So he did invent the yeah. sun. Um, he did, yeah. yes. Somebody put in the chat, yes, thou yes. shalt have no other gods before Jack Cruz. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> hey, Jack's, Jack is a mate of mine. I, I, I get on well with Jack. I, I do too. Jack. I do too. We just had I a also, falling out. I also like to um, I also like to translate Jack into English. Uh, for those that um, want to hear what he's got to say in English, that's one of the things I offer on my consultancy on my Patreon page, uh, by the way. Um, you know, yeah. Jack Cruz translation service. Yeah, no, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, despite what Jack Cruz might want you to believe, he didn't invent the uh, the outdoors. Um, nor does he seem to get out there much. But yeah, I would say, you know, go go outside, right? Like have hobbies that, that you know, when you're yeah. moving your body, um, that can really help. I know it can be hard if you have anxiety, if you have depression, it can be hard to motivate yourself to get outside. But go into battle with that. Mm. Like sometimes you got to just say, no, I'm doing it. Like I'm going to take the steps. I'm walking out the door and I'm going to get in some sunlight. I'm going to go, you know, walk by the river or the ocean or a lake, wherever's near you. Bodies of water are real peaceful and relaxing. So I think that's a good one. And of course, diet, like you mentioned too. Um, yeah. You yeah. know, Alberto said it's a. So there is. Oh, oh. Alberto said for $5. Thanks, Alberto. I know you were here yesterday too. He says it is important to talk about LDL particles, not just totals. LDLB is easily oxidized, increasing inflammation. LDLA, the good fats, and LDLB, carbs and bad fats. Yeah, okay. Let, let me cover that to the best of my uh, knowledge and ability on it. Uh, there is an amount of inference out there in, in the scientific literature talking about those exact issues. There is a differentiation between uh, – when we say HDL, LDL, IDL, these are categories of lipoproteins. They are differentiated from one another by having different proteins that encode for their structure. The ApoB100 protein is the LDL, um, the thing that defines an LDL as an LDL. However, within the family of LDL lipoproteins, they're not all the same size. They're not all the same density in terms of um, the protein to uh, lipid um, cargo ratios, I guess, is another way of thinking about that. And there are there are ones that are called um, small, dense LDLs, and there are other ones called large, fluffy LDLs, and they're just terms we use to sort of help people to visualize the difference between them. Um, so if you like, um, I'm a small, dense LDL, and Tristan, you're a large, fluffy. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Uh, you're like, well, you've got the whole ball, I get bad it, I get it. man thing yeah. going. 
<laughs> You're allowed to. No, I'm not a fan. You know, you just so, call me fat, whatever, on my own show. It's okay. Thanks. That's it. I got Durian Rider. Hey, Durian hey. Rider called me a steroid user, and you call me fluffy. So, um, thank yeah. Stop fucking eating. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, right? We need, we need coal on here to. <laughs> the, uh, you know, hey, uh, so, I mean, uh, the, the difference there is that the, the, the small, dense LDLs will go into those yeah. gaps. And the fluffy ones aren't the such large an fluffy issue. Ones. And a lot of the people on low okay. carb diets, so, they might have, to, they might have a lot of the large fluffy, but not a lot of the small dense. Yes, exactly. The, the way you get a lot more small dense ones is to eat a high carbohydrate diet, especially high in fructose. Yeah, right. Hey, coming back, so, so somebody's yeah. in the chat, and he mentioned L-theanine for um, uh, for supplementation of L-theanine, which is an amino acid for anxiety. And I agree, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, but. Yeah, it, it can, yeah, yeah, it, it can actually. It, I find it gave me the runs in higher doses, like two hundred milligrams. I think gave me the runs. So you might want to make sure you're not too high of a dose. There you go, hypoallergenic dog. Professor Fluffy's in the house. She she's here to to peer review and make sure that we don't tell she's any lies. She's a puppy, right? She's fluffy. a baby, isn't she? She's actually six okay, years old. So she's a mini. This, this is it. Schnauzer. She's full size. She is a Chinese crusted powder puff. Oh. The normally ball, except for a little. Um. That's but this so one's a throwback. Cool. Aren't you? You're a throwback. Look at how she snuggles in. She like shakes with love when she snuggles you. What a sweet. Oh, oh, yeah, that's oh, sweet, oh, man. Like he also mentioned adaptogenic gets... herbs like ashwagandha. Yeah, you know, some of those herbs, I'm not against plants, and I think that's a great recommendation. We got an article if you guys want to learn a little bit more about ashwagandha and holy basil. Those can be useful. I like the tinctures, uh, not like the straight up... Mm -hmm. uh, herbs of them i think a lot of these herbs can be useful so some people they get on carnivore or whatever and they think oh that means all plants are bad i think plants have great medicinal properties many of them uh but not all of them yes. you know spinach ain't medicine um so yeah good 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 information there coach charles health and fitness revisit i think i've seen you around thanks for the uh for the good advice there i had a great chat with coach charles nice. a few weeks ago um he's he's a he's a recovered yeah. vegan um, he, he's seen the light. Um, he's also a friend of Bobby Risto's. Um, we had a really great chat. If people want to see that, um, so Charles, nice to see you. Awesome. If people want to see that, it's, it's, it's on both his channel and my channel. There you go. Um, and I think we should we'll go and sub to Coach Charles. Um, Charles Rufu. There you go. So, and then, yeah, if you want to learn more about adaptogenic herbs, Jessica wrote an article a while ago, and there's actually some links. Um, uh, if you're in the U.S., uh, Mountain Rose Herbs, they have some really good herbal extracts of some of these adaptogens. So if you want to learn how to use holy basil ashwagandha for, um, you know, correcting circadian rhythm or reducing stress, you can check out. If you search ashwagandha on our website, which there's a link in the description, mm -hmm. you can find that one. Um, so, yeah, that's all the super chats. Wait, wait, one more. We had five euros. Deges Spinavi says, sorry if I butchered your name, my friend. Great discussion, guys. Have a question for Bart and then didn't leave a question. Uh, so if you want to ask the question, I'll try and look for your name in the chat. Um, uh, yeah, I get, or maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe you ask the question when you, uh, when you hear this, man. So yeah, um, back to the subject at hand, Bart. We were talking about inflammation we're talking about atherosclerosis and uh talked about a lot of things. we talked mm -hmm. about polyunsaturated fatty acids and the connections there um yeah you just talked about large fluffy versus small dense ldls Are there any that you want to expand on that a little bit more or uh, i mean pretty much that covers it it's it's the, the the mistake that's made is that people call the large fluffy ones non-proatherogenic and the small dense ones proatherogenic that's still a mistake just because they are small and dense and will fit into those loose gap junctions doesn't mean they are pro atherogenic mm. an ldl only becomes pro atherogenic when it's been jammed into a gap junction mm. and then has been chemically modified by either oxygen or glucose or both there you go then it's pro atherogenic but then it's also not ldl anymore because it has been chemically altered, it is now something mm -hmm. else. So anyone that says, "Look, here is even a mechanism by which LDL is involved in the development of heart disease," you can still turn around and say, "No, it isn't." The only thing that will cause a lesion to start occurring, the only thing that will cause your immune system to react, is if it sees a non-native protein. Hey, this looks a lot like ApoB100 that I generated myself in my own body last week. It looks similar, 
However, there's been a couple of uh, electrons ripped out of it. It's been changed around chemically a bit. It looks a bit different. That's not me. That could be an invading pathogen. I need to attack it with my immune system, so have it. Mm. Buff. So your body is not reacting to your own native LDL. It never will. Why would it? It's reacting to something different. A spade is a spade, and oxidized LDL is not LDL. It's oxidized LDL. Mm -hmm. End of debate. You lose. Charlie Brown. Yes. Got it. Another Charlie Brown. <laughs> that's, like a fi that's like five Charlie Browns this, this episode, man. We're good. We need a little counter at the bottom where yeah. every time someone says Charlie Brown, it's ching ching um, <laughs> yeah. like, like throwing a tip in the swear jar. Awesome. All right. Um, mm. Let's see. Let's, let's go over here in the chat and see if the, uh, the chat's got anything to say. Um, we should also have a counter that counts how many times I say Richard Burgess is a pussy. Oh, goodness. Goodness. One. Sometimes <laughs> you catch more flies with honey, Bart. Yeah, I don't really care if I ever catch that <laughs> fly. All right. No offense, Richard. I'm not saying I think I've already, I think I've already killed that fly, to be yeah. fair. Hey, what about, you got some people talking about the use of cannabis. Uh, Zero Carb Alex, he's, uh, he's been around for a while. He's got a wrench in the chat. He's talking about CBD hindering HCV virus, uh, uh, virus to replicate in vitro. I guess he's talking about maybe hepatitis C um, virus. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure uh, if that's what he's talking about. But what do you think about cannabis? Like a lot of people in the low car, or not even low car, a lot of people in carnivore start to get like almost... Plants are terrible. Plants are awful. There does seem to be a mm. lot of research on the benefits of cannabis medicinally, especially terpenes yes. now. So terpenes, I think, yeah. is a funny one. And uh, I, would, I would have loved to talk to uh, maybe Paul Saladino. Next time I'll talk to Paul about this too. But um, yeah, terpenes have been mentioned as a plant toxin by some people. But uh, from the research I've seen, certain terpenes in certain situations can be highly therapeutic and beneficial. Uh, what do you think about some of these other, you know, plant-based medicine, CBD, uh, uh, THC, or just, you know, full-spectrum extracts from the cannabis yeah. plants. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, yeah. I, I mean, I, I grew up in New Zealand, so... Is there I a mean, big cannabis, cannabis culture there? Right. Right? Uh, That's absolutely yeah, right. California, yeah. so I um, you know, no. Same deal, and and I guess down there in Ecuador, you'd probably find some down there if you really wanted to look I, I uh, as well, I would imagine. never have known uh, anything about anything like that, ever. No, of course. Um, however, having grown up in New Zealand, it's pretty much an unavoidable rite of passage. I, I certainly have experimented. I certainly have used uh, cannabis um, in, a, in a recreational he sense. Did the pot. For the kids uh, out there, for, the, yeah, for all you Gen Z oh, kids, he absolutely. was doing the pot when yeah. he was a kid. I guess that's what Yeah. 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 And, um, did you inject? Or did you snort it? No, no, I smoked. Snort, you didn't snort it? I smoked. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I used to smoke you didn't it. inject your joints? Uh, and sometimes I would... <laughs> No, sometimes I'd eat it too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so smoking and eating were, were my my roots of um, of delivery, mm -hmm. as it were. Um, so, I mean, absolutely, and it, it's it's one of those things that was it was a real solid part of my um, my upbringing, I guess, through my teenage years and early early twenties as well. Uh, way back when Adam was in short pants, that is. Um, you know, of course, it's different times now. Um, <laughs> Even more people are, are, are on cannabis down here, I think, than we were back then. And it's much different stuff. It's much stronger. It's been hydroponically selected and and and, and bred for higher THC and lower CBD, yeah, which the, is not yeah, a good thing. Yeah, the growing thing, outside you, of the sun balance. seems like a weird thing, right? These growing indoors and artificial yeah. light and all that. That's that's yeah. a really strange industry now. Yeah. Yeah, so these are all you know functions of the illegality and all that kind of stuff uh, that causes these things to occur, uh, and also people you know ever seeking more and more powerful, more and more dangerous versions, so they keep selectively breeding it for more and more THC. Uh, the, the thing with, the, with cannabis is that it is therapeutic if the CBD to THC ratio is right. Mm. If you start ramping up the THC, which is the psychoactive component that gets you high. And you hold the the CBD down to its natural level, which is quite low. That will start messing around with things, and there can be some very negative effects of that to psychologically, long term, and and whatever else. So that's not indicated. That's not a good thing. In terms of the research that that cannabis has very clear therapeutic uh, effects. One of those, and I think it might be what the, what the question was about actually, was actually cancer cells as well. 
um, THC can actually stop cancer cells in their tracks um, of various different sorts at various yeah, times. I saw a lot of people I'm using the underground the Rick Simpson oil stuff, which is a really strong extract, mm. the oil-based extract of, full, yep. of cannabis yep. plant, and uh, they were getting really good results. Yep. I mean, kids with uh, epilepsy, too, mm. getting good results. So I think it's a, kind of undeniable there can yeah. be benefits. But, yeah, no, I agree with you. There can be definitely yeah. downsides, too. I mean, if people... You know, obviously it's not uh, physically addictive, but people can become psychologically addicted to it and use it to kind of escape. And, um, you know, I mean, it definitely mm. short term memory loss can be a real thing with cannabis. I experienced that when I was a kid. Yeah. And, and also short term memory loss can be a problem. Yeah. No, but but it may, have you heard of short term memory loss with weed? Well, I mean, there's a lot of things about weed that are really, you know, quite good, I think. Um, but, you know, one of the things that really, really gets to me is the short term memory loss. <laughs> Uh, which also happens long term on a vegan diet, um, mm. McGregor, McDougal, Mc, 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 whatever he's called. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> McDickle. Yeah. Dr. Mc, Dr. McDickle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Or Durian Douchebag. Durian, Durian Reuter. Uh, yeah. The Reuter. <laughs> <laughs> Douchebag Reuter. There we go. That's what it is. Yeah. So I think, yeah, the, the, the terpene issue is interesting to me, though, because when you see in uh, the industry now, because like now that it's legal, I mean, even a lot of the guys that I went to college with are now. They're in kind of the legal cannabis industry, and uh, they do terpene extracts and stuff. And there are people using therapeutic levels of certain terpenes to treat certain things, and they're trying to figure out what effect these terpenes have in, in different contexts. So I think that's a that's an interesting one in the context of plant toxins, because many people you know believe that terpenes are toxic plant compounds that are bad and that should be avoided, but they're also being used for you know therapeutic purposes by others. So I think that's a uh, that's a pretty interesting thing. My mouse, yep. shit, my mouse disconnected. I'm trying to get it back. Ugh. Oh, panic, so panic. Panic. So This stream will never end now, guys, because my mouse is disconnected. Um, here. This is the song. I'm gonna, I'm gonna disconnect ends. it from the computer real quick. <laughs> oh, well, now that he's gone, boys and girls, let's start telling you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> now that now that the the fluffy one is gone big to, fluffy ldl that's it he's gone to other pastures fluffy man bad fluffy man bad yeah, let's see if that works <laughs> no that doesn't work well okay. i'll just hope it doesn't keep disconnecting and reconnecting and i'll connect it before i end the stream so um yeah yeah that's an interesting one uh, i can't see the chat anymore because I don't have this. Yeah, what else comes to mind, Bart? Anything else? Uh, anything else tickling your fancy lately? Um, uh, I, I guess. I mean, we can f carefully, very briefly mention some of the hate speech that's been going on within our own carnival community in the last week or Dude, two. People have been people um, have been criticizing me, and I consider any criticism of me hate speech. So I would love to talk about that because and right. because I'm trans vegan, um, any vegans that actually don't accept me uh, as a member of their community. Goji man also hate speech um but yeah yes. yeah what's been going on man what happened well i mean you know there was sort of claims of plagiarism and and non-crediting uh of of various you know ideas uh that i i guess at the end of the day we we all share um and, and we're all actually on the same team trying to pull the same direction trying to rescue the hearts and minds of these lost souls who have been sucked into the the vegan uh, idiocy uh, and I just think that as I said on a video um, at the time that you know uh, there are others who are who are much better targets for being um, criticized uh, than members of our own community um, as a result of that um, Frankie got upset with me and said he didn't want to do the video with me next week that we were going to do about um, grounding earthing actually uh, but the latest I've heard from Frank is that he actually does want to go ahead and do that video, and I'm really looking forward to that, Frank. As I have said repeatedly, love you, brother. Um, you're a good man, uh, and you know, let's get back to pulling together as a team. Um, but there are also, that aside, there are also much more hateful, much more nasty things going on. In fact. Um, there seems to be an element, it's not a large element, but, but clearly a significant element of those who support the carnivore lifestyle, 
who also support other ideologies uh, around uh, racial discrimination, uh, supremacy, um, and various uh, ridiculous, hateful, nonsensical ideologies that really should have been left behind in the 1940s. And I thought that's what we actually dealt with at the time by doing that. But apparently some of these folk are still around. Uh, and some of them are um, or have been supporters of, of what I've been doing on the basis that I've been su supporting a carnivore diet. Um, and, and I guess I would say to those people, um, please spread your hate somewhere else. Did, what, oh, really? I think I, I, you had put up a video and I watched a couple minutes of it, but then... Uh... I had to run out the door, and then when I came back, it, it, the video was gone. Um, yeah, the reason for that is I took it down, and the reason for that is I got a lot of negative feedback from so-called uh, supporters. I'm going to say a lot, you know, relative to my total subscriber pool. I'm only like, we're talking about less than a hundred, uh, but and there's people there's people in every community that have different ideologies too, and um, yeah, no, I. I yeah. Yeah, I get some comments so, from people like, "Oh, why did you move to the country you live in?" and stuff like that. You know, just yeah, there's there's people with weird ideologies. I usually just I give people the quick ban, and you know, I get a lot of these neo pagans on there who want to talk about, "Oh, go drink baby's blood and stuff." You know, I give them a quick ban too. So and there's certain elements in every community that's just toxic, man. I mean, you look at Durian Rider within the vegan community, as opposed to somebody who's like. You know, I mean, Goji Man wants to help people. He, he He's coming from a twisted place, but he wants to help people. Whereas, you know, there's people like Durian Rider who just want to get some 19-year-old chick to play with his dinghy. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think there's there's definitely those nasty elements all around the internet, for sure. It's, it's unfortunate. Yes, I mean, I was, I, I, was just, I was just surprised that, I mean, I, I made a video that sort of called out that behavior and said, you know, like, there's no place for that on my channel. Actually, I don't subscribe to any of that kind of nonsense just because I'm a carnivore doesn't mean I believe in any of that. Uh, and I don't. Please don't come on my channel and make that kind of, you know, statement. You'll be banned, etc. A lot of people supported me in that and said, you know, thanks for doing that, good work and all that, and, and were supportive. But as I say, there was a significant block of, of folks who, who were really upset with me. Um, I mean, the, the original post was around someone who, that had said, look, it's really nice to see um, an Anglo-Saxon warrior, but with a pretty white Scandinavian girl. Oh, they're taking a dig because you white got a mixed race people. relationship and they don't like that. Right, they, and as, as it turns out, yeah. you know, while, while my partner is Swedish, absolutely, okay. and uh, she's also half South American Inca. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, this, so, so they're, they're trying to take a little back. dig and say, oh, you should be with a white woman. Whatever, man, these people are dumb. You know what, if, I think most of these guys, they're like 15-year-old kids, a lot of them. Uh, they're like, you know, Sverige's fans who send them their blood to drink and stuff like that. I mean, there's a lot of degeneracy on the internet and it's just... You know, I mean, it's there. Um, there's oh, man, it's there. The internet is crazy. The way that these cults spring up, and uh, yeah, so I think I find that these people feed off of the uh, the responses too. So it's sometimes it's better to just wipe it aside, and and um, yeah, I agree with you, man. So anyway, these people I, are crazy. I, I got pissed off. I made that video. Some people didn't like it, so I just ah, well, you know, it's not actually uh, helping anybody. The person that made that comment is banned anyway. They can fuck right off, and uh, and we'll just move on. But it was just one of those things that. Yeah. Like, I didn't know if you'd come across my I do, yourself, man. Tristan. They tell me all the time wow. you worship a Jew on a stick. They tell me that uh, you know you're 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 a cuck a cuckianity and stuff. And it's like you look at these people's profiles and they're like, you know, they've got like the the Thor's hammer and they're like talking about my ancestors, my ancestors. We're gonna you know the neo pagan revival and all this stuff. It's like I don't know, man. I mean, I kind of debate with these people sometimes in comment sections and stuff. Ask them to go and do 23 and me and we'll see where they come yeah, from. Yeah, no, I mean, a lot of these people, they're, they're LARPing, man. They want, they want something to believe in and they've rejected, they've, you know, they, they reject the truth anyways and they don't want what's real. They want their little games to play and uh, I think it's lame. And, uh, you know, what, when, you, when you're, you talked about um, t attacking other people within carnivory, uh, in like out of jealousy and insecurity, I think that that stuff is. I mean, it, it it's it's all on display for us to see what people are all about. And uh, there's certain people who are trying to really help people. And I think everybody, we all should want to. Um, the goal should be. 
getting people off pharmaceutical drugs, stopping this big ag agenda, this big pharma, big agriculture um, agenda, and, mm-hmm. and stopping the degeneration of our physical bodies and of our culture at large. And, uh, um, you know, if that's not the goal, if your goal is just to get as much attention and props undeserved as possible, then uh, you have no place in my circles anyway. So it's like if your goal is to help people, great, I'm with you. Let's help people. But if your goal is to take other people's work and pretend like it's yours and then if somebody else cites the same work to say, oh, that's mine, then that's childish and that's silly. And I'll say this, you know, uh, I I like a lot of the work a lot of these people are doing in the movement. And, uh, you know, I think your talk with Dr. Paul Saladino was great. And I think there's people bringing a lot of value to the space by sharing these ideas and and getting it out to a broader audience and making it – making it palatable to highbrow intelligent people. So I think there's different niches within the big niche and we don't need to be fighting over intellectual territory and pretending like we invented something that we had Googled. And, uh, and I think we, uh, we all got to just uh, you know, pull up ourselves by our bootstraps and actually take note of what's really important and that's freaking helping people. Let's help people. Let's yep. stop the degeneration of our bodies and our minds and our cultures by this you know, toxic processed food, pharmaceutical drug culture, and um, and let's do it. Hey, we're going to do it together. We can do it together. But if you're going to be attacking everybody and pretending like it's all about you and you just want the attention and the credit, then, um, then you know, you can kick rock from my circle. You know, I mean, there's guys out there, Dr. Sean Baker, Michaela Peterson, um, you know, Paul Saladino, yourself. You got, well, who else? Mark Bell. Uh, a lot of these people who are pushing these ideas, even I think like Elliot Hulse lately getting into some of the carnivore stuff as well. You know, there are people out there pushing to uh, to make meat great again, man. And that's that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring, bring back the meat. We're trying to, uh, you know, make it uh, make it palatable for people. So let's not fight amongst each other. Leave that to the vegans. Leave the effeminate uh, posturing and fighting to the uh, to the birds and the vegans. That's my opinion on it. Um, so, yeah, I'm just... We got nothing but love for the community here, and uh, yeah, quit quit spreading your silly stuff. Yeah, if I'm gonna live in Ecuador, it's not because I'm a cuck and I don't want to move back to I don't know where should I move? Should I move to uh, to Scotland where my ancestors are from? And uh, should I move to uh, or should I move to Holland? Uh, which one of them should I move to? Because I'm an American and I've got ancestors from all over the the Americas and uh, and Europe and this whole ancestral. You know, you gotta you gotta marry the woman that I approve of stuff. That's silly, man. I I support Pim and Bart, and I think you guys are great. And uh, you guys will have beautiful babies one day. And who cares if uh, if somebody's not trying to um, not trying to uh, to adhere to your racial ideology? That's what I guess. Indeed. All right. Thank you for that. That's that's pretty much. I think that covers it. Um, as I say, I'm looking very forward to next week when uh, the plan is for Frank and I to do a video about earthing and grounding. Um, so I hope that's still on. Uh, that'll be good. Well, yeah, I've, earthing and I've grounding, really that's an enjoyed... interesting one, man. It's like people feel great when they go hang yeah. out at the beach all day, get in the sun, get their feet in the ocean, you know, you know you walk yeah. in on the, your bare feet on the ground. I think it's awesome. But a lot of these hippies yeah. take it too far, man. You see these South American hippies, these Argentinians and stuff. They get, they go barefoot through the streets, and there's broken glass and shit all over the place. That's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> That's a, yeah, yeah be careful out there with the grounding in the street with those broken glass, guys. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, uh, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed our chat today, Tristan, yeah. as usual. I think it's, um, it's always an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Um, one-on-one it, it's even more fun when i'm don't have to be on and i can just watch you destroy someone like durian douchebag that was so classy i uh, just loved it um you know let's let's do this again of course yeah, yeah. um uh, you know and and soon um any of you people who are primal edge people who are not subscribed to me why not there you go there you go so Get over to my channel. And subscribe. Yeah, there's a link down in the description box for Bar K's channel, and then also uh, you guys got to check out the Carnivore Cookbook for people who really love animals. Yes, Jessica, just put that out, Bart. It's good. Yeah, too. Bart, you got it's you got really your copy. Good. What do you think, Bart? What's the review? Man, it's awesome. It's awesome. Not it's, a plant was harmed in the making of this book. It's all animal foods. No, no plants were harmed. And it's flat. It, you know, for it's, all the it's flat really... earthers out there, this book is flat. Do I know there's these flat earth people yeah. who sometimes get banned from my chat for flat earth spamming it. This book is flat just yeah. for you guys. Well, 
you know, actually, it's an electronic format, so it doesn't actually even have a shape there at all. There you go. Yours is, yeah. So, and, uh, you know, it's hard to shift it to New Zealand, or I definitely would have sent you a hard copy, my friend. But we got it in an ebook format mm. and as a as a hard cover. And if, you know... if mm. No, I, I appreciate that. And, and send my thanks to Jessica for that. Awesome. Um, you know? Yeah, yeah. So you guys, got to. Awesome we're all about eat, meat, make families here. And uh, if you guys want to support the work we do here, make sure to check out the Carnivore Cookbook for people who really love animals. It is one hundred percent, um, one hundred percent animal foods. There are no plant foods in the book, and uh, it's really fun. It's kind of a, it's a very unique book, very very unique book. There's nothing really out there like it. So you guys will be stoked. Um, I don't think I have any more announcements here. The next Keto and Carnivore Collective is starting today for this month. We actually sponsored, I think it was even more than 10. We sponsored a lot of vegans for free this month in our coaching uh, in our coaching session, in our group coaching session. So this is going to be fun. We're doing kind of a vegan rescue here. So um, all the vegan viewers out there, we're here to help you. We're here to uh, help you to transition out of the cult, to help you reformat your diet and include the most nutrient-dense, bioavailable, easily digestible foods that aren't going to uh, slam your gut, that aren't going to cut up your gut with all them oxalates, with all those salicylates, and they're not going to be blocking the absorption of the valuable vitamins and minerals and nutrients that we need. So let's, um, let's all come together. Let's help save these vegans from the cult of degeneracy that they've, uh, that they've been duped into, and uh, let's make meat great again, guys. So check out the cookbook. Uh, the Carnivore Cookbook for people who really love animals. That's available now in the link in the description. And make sure to subscribe to Bark K. We'll see you guys next time. All right.